Okay, hello everyone, welcome and thanks for joining us. My name is Robert, I will be your co-host. This is The War for Ukraine, a historical and contemporary analysis, part two. We had part one back on March 5th. Let's go ahead and get started. This program is being recorded for YouTube and so you can watch it later or if you have to jump off early, it'll be available. We'll email out the links for it, but that might not be until tomorrow. Um, so we'll email the links if you need to jump off. And this program is being presented by our good friends at History Mostly Ancient Discussions Meetup Group based in New York City. Uh, and then also the Washington DC History and Culture Organization, our sister groups, Baltimore History and Culture, New York History and Culture, and London History and Culture. My name is Robert Kellerman. I'm currently joining you from Texas. I split my time between Texas and Washington, D.C., and I'm a big history buff. And with that, I'd like to introduce the panelists. We have actually a few more hosts than just this distinguished group, but we'll go through from left to right. Richard, you want to introduce yourself very quickly? Hi, uh, my name is Richard Sassoon. I'm a lawyer by training, so this is just uh, my fun activity and hobby. Um, I'll walk you through a little bit of the history of Ukraine, and then I'll sort of give it over to the rest of the panelists to sort of discuss more pressing issues, more pressing questions. Uh, please put those uh, either in the chat or in the Q&A uh, so we can organize them. Um, and uh, we're really excited to, uh, to, hear, uh, to meet you and to uh, talk to you about this situation. Awesome. And Richard recently hosted our five-part History of the Crusades series. So I'll also email that and post the links for that in the chat in Zoom. Aaron, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Aaron De Los Reyes, uh, and I live in uh, northern New Jersey. I uh, work in uh, technology engineering, and I spent over a dozen years in the U.S. Army and uh, uh, Armored Cavalry. And I'm a big history buff. I work with Richard and uh, Zach uh, on a bunch of uh, uh, history of, uh, of, of the last uh, three to 500 years uh, programs. Awesome. Excellent. Well, welcome, Aaron. And our good friend Zakar is the brains of this operation. So Zakar, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, guys. Um, you guys see my video? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yep. Hi guys, uh, my name is Zakar Suleiman. I'm a finance professional, actually. Um, and but I've started this group in called History Most Ancient, and you can check out the link, and we'll post it later. But um, today, you know, basically, you know, we tried to create a panel. Just want to make it very short, sweet, and uh, panel that will discuss uh, the Ukrainian conflict, and uh, you know, we'll we'll walk to it. But I just want to say a couple things about my group, History Most Ancient. You know, we particularly focused on. Uh, ancient medieval history, but now recently we've been started doing the more modern and collaborating with uh, Robert. And uh, the beginning video that we just played that was sent to me by a friend of mine who is right now in Kiev. Uh, he was my classmate in high school in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And uh, that, that was the um, video of Mariupol, which is in Eastern Ukraine, and uh, it completely destroyed. So without further ado, I'll let um, Robert speak or whoever else you want to introduce. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks, Akar. So we have a couple other guests joining us. Um, we don't have his photo, but our distinguished panelist also includes Greg. Greg, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Uh, so my name is uh, Greg Rizak. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I actually, I was uh, born and grew up in Moscow and uh, moved in uh, to United States uh, during the communist time, like 42 years ago. Yep. Uh, both of my parents are from, were born in Ukraine and came to live in Moscow as teenagers during the World War II. Uh, so I have uh, kind of uh, relatives and friends on both sides. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, I support Ukraine in this. All right. Okay, thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. And we have one more panelist. Daniel, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, all, and other times. Uh, my name is Daniel Andreevich Halitskov. I was born in Kiev, Ukraine, and I spent my first 19 years of life growing up there. Um, when I was 20, I moved to these United States. So professionally, um, I work for an international humanitarian organization, Doctors Without Borders, in their HQ in New York. I help them raise money. Uh, by night, I'm Batman. And I have a finance background. I, I'm a Baruch College alumni. I think Zahar is Bearcat as well. Uh, my favorite colors are purple and white. I'm a cat person. 
and my favorite food is pizza. And just to settle this debate once and for all, pineapples do not go on pizza. <laughs> uh, <laughs> never. And a uh, little, little fun fact, I've been to every single castle in Ukraine. And in Ukraine, there are just like a few dozens of them. So I'm a huge history buff. And uh, I came to this group by accident. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. Welcome. And again, if you were joining us late, this is the War for Ukraine, a historical and contemporary analysis. So we're going to go talk to the situation from both a historical and contemporary standpoint. This program is being recorded. So if you have to jump off early, if you want to watch it again, or if you know anyone else that's interested, it'll be available on YouTube. We'll email out the link for that, but that probably won't take place until tomorrow. And if you have any questions or comments throughout our program, we welcome people to type those in the chat or the Q&A. We'll try and respond to as many of those as we can. And with that, let me turn things over to Richard. Richard, take it away. It's all yours. Hi. So welcome, as we said, to the Ukraine uh, War 2022 Q&A session. Um, and uh, sort of just to sort of put out the rules, um, I, this is not an academic presentation. Um, I'm not an academic, um, and as you can hear from everybody here, none of us are academics. We're not classically trained in history, philosophy, religion, uh, and the other topics that we're going to be discussing today. That said, uh, we will provide the information from sort of a secular perspective, trying to analyze it from a historical perspective. Um, and given the nature of the topic, we ask that everybody be uh, respectful but that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be interactivity. Please put your questions um, in either the Q&A or the chat. Um, if they are questions related to something that, I, that somebody has just said, please put those in the chat because I do read the chat. Um, if there's sort of just questions that have come into your head for whatever reason, please put those in the Q&A. Uh, that way I can begin to organize those for the panel period. And the way that this is going to work is that there's gonna be a short presentation, probably around 30, 40 minutes, um, discussing the history of Ukraine over the last 400 years or so that got us to this point. And then we'll have a discussion with the panelists where we can answer uh, some more relevant and pressing questions um, uh, concerning this, uh, this war and how it's been progressing. Um, Uh, and just like the previous session, which was three and a half hours, uh, this will be recorded so you can watch it later. You can also watch any of the other recordings that our group History Mostly Ancient has put together. Um, I've been doing a Middle Eastern history series, for example. We're going to have our 32nd episode on Thursday. Um, there's a European Union series that I do with Aaron uh, about security issues in the EU. Um, there are There's a series about ancient Rome. We do all kinds of uh, different discussions and we encourage you uh, to watch our offerings, all of which are offered as well on the New York Culture Group. And uh, so, all right, uh, here's the beginning. So the thing that we have to realize is that we had this migration of Slavs first uh, from what's now uh, the Ural Mountains area into uh, Eastern Europe. And those Slavs spread out into different areas. But what we care about for the discussion here are the Eastern Slavs. And uh, the Eastern Slavs uh, begin to settle uh, throughout uh, what's now Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, um, and they become a number of different tribal peoples. Starting in Kiev, um, these different tribes begin to decide that they want to confederate under a unitary government. And so they bring in um, the uh, Varangians. The Varangians are sort of the civilized version of the Vikings, right? They're coming from the same Norse region. They come down uh, the Dnieper River and they settle in Kiev. And so they create this sort of alliance between them as rulers and the Slavs as the general people, because they can all agree to allow these foreigners to rule them as opposed to their own sort of uh, domestic um, situation. Now, uh, this confederation expands throughout uh, Ukraine, Belarus, most of Russia, you can see in the map in the lower left-hand side, or the map uh, sort of towards the center in pink, uh, the amount of territory that was part of this Kievan Rus confederacy. Now, it's important to remember that this Kievan Rus is the progenitor 
of almost all the modern Eastern Slavic cultures. It's the progenitor of Russian culture. It's the progenitor of Belarusian culture. It's the progenitor of Ukrainian culture. All of these are coming out of Kievan Rus, but all of them sort of see Kiev as the center of where this historical development occurred. Uh, do any of our panelists want to make a quick comment on this? Yeah, yeah Rick. If, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Greg, uh, I just wanted to. Uh... Uh, Greg, let me just point out quickly. Of course, so, go ahead. And, uh, they actually are related to the. Um, so they're, they're called Varangians by mostly Russians. And uh, the history of it was uh, that was actually presented to us by one of the monks uh, in the 1100s that they were invited by Slav um, tribes to unite Slavic uh, um, tribes because they were kind of. Um, um, all discombobulated, and therefore they actually relate to the Swedish um, uh, bureaucracy uh, of Vikings. And uh, Kievan Rus is considered to be first Viking state, believe it or not, uh, that was created. Before that, there was no Viking state. They were all mostly, um, you know, living as a tribal uh, society. Just want to add that, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, just wanted to add a little bit. So Kiev. Uh... Uh, was the center and the dominating state uh, uh, between uh, starting from 9th century till the end of the 11th century. Uh, at that time, it started to decline, uh, and especially after the Fourth Crusade in 1204, when uh, um, Constantinople was sacked, uh, it went into complete decline. Uh, so the, the center of gravity in the, for the Eastern Slavs started to move uh, toward the Northeast, in the Vladimir Suzdal uh, area, you see on the lower map Suzdal, uh, and and the, in in this area, uh, that's where the Moscow originated, and the official date is 1147, when Prince uh, Yuri Longhand uh, built the wall around the settlement, and uh, later on in in the beginning of the uh, uh, 13th century, uh, uh, you know Moscow. Uh, started a descendant of the, of the son of uh, Alexander Nevsky, who was a most prominent prince of Novgorod at the time. Uh, uh, he became prince of uh, Moscow. And, and at, at Moscow started to rise. Mostly it, it started to be uh, dominating in, uh, in the 14th century and, uh, and eventually in the 15th century under Ivan III, the grandfather of Ivan the Terrible. It became uh, a, an independent state. Uh, uh, specifically in 1480. Uh, and from there on, that's the rise uh, of Russia uh, and, and the beginning of the Russian national identity. If I may add just a bit, um, I see that a lot of you spell Kiev as K-I-E-V. So here is the proper perspective. Kiev is how you say Kiev in Russian. In Ukrainian, you would say Kyiv. So the proper spelling would be K Y I V. Uh, it would make you smarter by, by a factor of 10, and you can brag about it with your colleagues. And also, a little known fact that the Vikings who had descended from the north um, in our history, and I, I got my education in, in, in Kiev. And the first prominent figure was Rurik, the troublemaker who had descended from the north. And little known fact that the Ukrainian um, coat of arms is a trident. And from what I've been told, it was Rurik's coat of arms as well. And little bonus points on that tri trident, uh, you can actually spell out uh, Ukrainian word will. So Ukrainians are very, very popular for will. It, it, it's all about will. Yes, Kiev. So there are a couple questions that have sort of come up in the chat uh, in the in the sort of period here. Um, the first one is what is the definition of a Slav? A Slav, uh, there's a certain set of languages that sort of fit together um, from the Indo-European tree that branch off. And these are Slavic languages. And these groups of people primarily exist in what's now Central and Eastern Europe, right? Poland, 
uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, or what are called Northern Slavs or Western Slavs. You have the portion that's in the Balkans area, that's uh, your Croats, your Bosnians, your Slovenians, your Serbs, your Macedonians, um, your Bulgarians. These are what are called Yugoslavs or Southern Slavs. And then you have your population in the East, that's your Belarusians, your Ukrainians, your Russians. These are the Eastern Slavs. So it's, uh, so it's that uh, situation. And somebody made a comment that Ukraine should be Swedish. In many cases in Europe, people were ruled by monarchs that came from a foreign dynasty, right? We have to remember the House of Windsor that rules the United Kingdom right now is actually the House of Saxe Goethe. It's a German dynasty. So it's very common for the kings of European states to not be from ethnically the same background as the people they rule over. Um, and the Slavs formed a coalition with these Norse peoples, primarily because they were an outsider people, right? That way it wouldn't be one of the Slavic groups overruling all the other ones. And the and these groups, uh, the Varangians were relatively well organized. So it ended up working well uh, for this unity. All right. Um, then we get to moving forward by about 600 years, we get to the point where you have this Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And you can see that uh, this, this hybrid state between Lithuania in the eastern parts and Poland in the southern and western parts um, began to take over significant portions of, uh, of the east. And you can see it extends all the way into that hashed area, including the one controlled by the Lipko rebels. So a significant portion of western Ukraine today was under the control of Poland, including the city of Kiev. Now, what you begin to see at the end of uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, in that last hundred years between 1690, let's say, and 1790, is that you have groups of Cossacks who are um, speakers of an Eastern Slavic language, right? So they're not speakers of Polish, they're speakers of a different language, and they begin settling in large numbers uh, in this area that's now Ukraine, and they consider themselves Cossacks. Um, and the Cossacks come together to create their own government called the Zaporozhian host. And the Zaporozhians fight against the Polish to attain some sort of independence. Sometimes they fight uh, on the Ottoman side um, against the Poles. Sometimes they fight against the Russians supporting the Poles. There becomes a lot of tension uh, in the region as the Zaporozhians try to create uh, more independence for themselves. Um, do any of the panelists sort of want to comment on this period and sort of the creation of the first sort of Ukrainian independent minded polity uh, in sort of this fracturing of Europe? Yeah, uh, if I, I, I'd like to fill the blanks uh, briefly, of course, uh, uh, there was a period of uh, Mongolian domination uh, uh, starting from the first invasion in 1237. Uh, and then second, 1240, that's when the Kiev was destroyed. Uh, and most of the Russian cities, Eastern Slavic cities, I'm sorry, uh, were destroyed in that period, except maybe only uh, Novgorod, uh, one of the major cities that, uh, 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 um, uh, that had an agreement and uh, was subjugated peacefully. Uh, so it started to develop uh, afterwards. And uh, uh, then the, uh, when the, uh, Horde started to fragment uh, and, and weaken uh, in, in 15th century in particular. So that was the time when Lithuania started to expand and the uh, uh, famous uh, uh, in Lithuania, Prince Gediminas, uh conquered uh, Kiev in uh, 1321, in 1321 or 24. Um, and uh, from there on, uh, Lithuania became uh, uh, a, a country from Baltic to uh, Black Sea had huge uh, um, uh, territory. Uh, however, uh, the problems uh, with an expansion of uh, Russia uh, uh, made it clear, uh, Lithuania made a uh, pact with uh, Poland, uh, uh, eventually through the marriage of King Prince Jagiello and uh, um, uh, Princess Jadwiga. And, and that's how this uh, common, uh, Commonwealth uh, was originated. Uh, it was also to uh, uh, resist uh, the advance of the uh, Teutonic and Livonian Knights uh, from the West. And, uh, and that's how we come. Uh, uh, one point I would like to make, uh, uh, there is a very major uh, 
problem between Russians and Polish. Uh, and uh, even in, in current conflict, you could see that the Poland is the greatest supporter of Ukraine right now. They have a border, and that can, uh, happened during the, uh, the the Russia had only two uh, uh, dynasties, uh, uh, Rurik and, and Romanov. And uh, uh, there was a dark times in the beginning of the 17th century uh, uh, between 1598 and uh, 1613, uh, where uh, the question of uh, Russian Tsardom was uh, in question. And, and the Polish used uh, three fake uh, Dimitrius, uh, which is uh, a deceased son of uh, uh, Ivan the Terrible, uh, and took over Moscow for a period of time. So that is something that created a great enmity. Uh, it was uh, uh, when they, uh, in 1613, the Romanov uh, dynasty was restored, uh, not restored, uh, elected, uh, was created new dynasty. Uh, uh, it started to continue the expansion. And here we come to the point where uh, I think very important uh, uh, period of uh, uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky uh, in, uh, in the middle of 17th century started the uprising. Uh, the Cossacks mainly served as a buffer of both Russia and Poland against the um, Crimean Tatars, uh, but, but he started for uh, the fight for independence, uh, and eventually it was independence from Poland, and uh, uh, he asked for help from Russian Tsar Alexius Romanov, and uh, as a result, in 1654, there was an agreement made in uh, the city of Pereslav uh, that um, uh, for that help, eventually uh, Ukraine became part of Russia. So it was kind of a takeover. Uh, and from there on, uh, a big, mo most of the Ukraine uh, was part of the Russian empire. Uh, and, and that's the claim that uh, uh, now Putin is making uh, that this is... Uh, uh, one nation and the uh, same people. Okay. And, 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 and one other interesting, I think, note that's lost a lot in history is uh, that there was an attempt to, to basically make the, the Republic of Three Nations, which is the Polish, Lithuanian, Ruthian um, Commonwealth, um, and, and those Cossacks, uh, well, so, so they were fighting them in the 1840s and 50s, but then at the same time offering uh, ultimately to construct a, um, a, 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 you know, a new commonwealth in essence, or a, a, a new republic uh, with them, which obviously would have um, been pretty transformational uh, from a historical perspective. So any of you into sort of uh, counterfactuals or sort of uh, history on you or whatever, uh, the, I, I would recommend people really um, dig into the Polish uh, uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, uh, not just because I said it, uh, but I, I think it's a very uh, underappreciated um, period in history. Arguably, it's the most, um, they were the most ecumenically diverse uh, religious uh, set of republics in human history until the United States. Um, you know, when you look at the broad spectrum, I mean, it was almost uh, every denomination of almost any religion was welcome there, um, as long as you obviously paid, you know, tributes and so on. And they didn't, they had a, a limited tiering. Um, you know, they still had a tiering system, but it was very limited. And, and for that era, it was, you know, uh, arguably uh, freedom just, of, of religion. And just to put it in context, uh, Pol the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth had the largest population of Jews of any European state. It also had significant Muslim populations. So it wasn't just Catholics and Orthodox who lived there. Uh, you had a number of different religious minorities. And, um, and even on but, the North, you had uh, obviously lots of- um, yeah, Pagans. You know, yeah, pagan hybridist pagans, you know, who basically over time converted into into variant Christian uh, denominations or constructed them. I mean, so it was a, a it's really a, a phenomenal uh, uh, place and, and period. And when you look at the world, when you go back in history and you say, where would you like to live for a period of time that you could probably get away with not being that oppressed? It was a reasonably, if, as long as you weren't there or during the variant uh, partitions and destructions, um, it was uh, a, a reasonably peaceful and, and definitely 
uh, a freeing place. If you know, and back then we have to realize religion and freedom was the was the major freedom that that that, yeah. that that was the major suffrage that people sought or at least attempted to try to construct around when they when they sought freedom. Yeah, although the Protestants uh, had less religious freedom. Anyway, sure. Um, sure. if if we go to the um, the Zaporozhian host to the Cossacks, they begin to develop their own sort of government system. This is called the Zaporozhian Sich, uh, and it became the center of uh, the Cossack world. If you've seen on the news, for example, uh, that there was a power station in Zaporozhia, uh, it's actually very close to where this location is. And um, this was built, as you can see, on the river. This is a recreation of, of the Sich. And it began to try and make different kinds of alliances in order to assure that it would maintain some sort of independence. Uh, for example, right, you have Hetman, Hetman being the supreme commander, uh, Petro Doroshenko. Uh, he allied with the Ottomans uh, in order to keep uh, the uh, to keep the Poles out. Um, you have uh, Ivan Maseba, who was probably the last really independent ruler of the Zaporozhian Sich before it became uh, part of Russia. And um, you have a number of battles that are fought between uh, people that we can anachronistically call Ukrainians and, uh, and Russians, or anachronistically call Ukrainians and, and Polish. Um, so does anybody want to talk about eventually how in 1775, the Zaporozhian siege was simply annexed by Catherine the Great uh, to Russia and about this period? Well, I'm not sure about that, but I wanted to add the Hetman uh, Mazepa uh, in Russian culture, uh, he is considered to be a great traitor who tried to uh, drive uh, uh, Ukraine away from Russia and, and sided with uh, Swedish King Charles XII uh, uh, and uh, uh, eventually uh, uh, that, that was uh, um, uh, stalled after, after the Battle of uh, Poltava. In 1709, uh, the Russians um, uh, won the battle, and uh, Charles uh, uh, actually escaped uh, to Turkey. I think uh, so. That's um, that that part. I just wanted to add uh, about this integration. I, I led someone else to um, uh, at the time of the Catherine the Great uh, 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 to continue. But Russians considered Ukraine actually has been a part of Russian empire from that period, officially of 1654. Um, and, um, and, and that's that's probably, at, they were called at that time, little Russians. Uh, and uh, I can see that a lot of Ukrainians resent uh, these kind of um, uh, ideas, especially nowadays. I was gonna say, Daniel, could you give a little bit of context for what life as a Cossack was and, um, a number of both the panelists and I think the people watching um, are Jewish as well. And so, of course, there's sort of the negative view of the Cossacks from this period. Can you sort of uh, give us a little bit of light about sure. that? Richard, you were just reading my mind because I was just thinking that I want to talk about it. So for all of you who are interested, um, think of Zaporozhye Siege, which is presented on the bottom left picture. It's, it's, it's a safe heaven. It's an island. It's secluded. And the Dnipro River in that region is very hard to navigate because of a lot of uh, rocky formations. So not only you had kind of like this natural defense system, you also had people like the peasant boys fleeing their homes to join the siege, which is think of the brotherhood, think of, think of the Spartans. It kind of had that in mind. And think of the Cossacks as, I, I think the most accurate representation of Cossacks was warrior monks, because uh, obviously the siege was destroyed in 1775, and the picture on bottom right is a representation of it, but you can see kind of like different buildings, right? In the center, you had the church, so you had the priest, and uh, all of the Cossacks would like, not, it's like not only Sunday church, it's like everyday sermon. And uh, also consider that at that time, like there was no public education. So if you wanted to get educated, you have to join the church. And all of the Cossacks who would go to the siege, they would get this education. 
So one of those buildings would represent, you know, like a grad hall with uh, books and people do get educated. And Zaporozhian Cossacks were notorious warriors, notorious warriors. And what made them awesome, um, according to my history teacher, is so at that time you had what like muskets, uh, like single shot muskets, which would take eons to reload. So Cossacks were smart and they created this battle formation where you had front row of like Cossacks shooting muskets while semi simultaneously the second row behind them would reload those muskets and give them back in front. So like by, by doing that, they increased their rate of fire and they were notoriously good. Also, they were good horse riders because in that region, it's a southern of Ukraine, which is steppe. So you have a lot of horses, you have a lot of planes, and you can, you know, train yourself on how to ride a horse. And the weapons that Cossacks used for melee was, I, I don't know what it is called in English, but it's called shabla, which is like a curved sword. Scimitar. Thank you. Uh, so obviously it was good on horseback because you have this momentum and you just, you know, slicing and dice in your enemies. And also the one thing that I want you to pay attention, if you would go back to the previous slide, please. I want you all to pay close attention. And this is, this is the stuff that we'll be talking uh, later today. The Zaporozhian, the Zaporozhian siege, the independent Zaporozhian Ukrainian government, if you were so call it, is right in the middle. So it's always been, I just want you to pay attention geographically that Ukraine has always been like this buffer zone between the West and the East, split right along the Dnipro River. So to the West, you have uh, Western ideals, you have Christianity, Catholicism, you have Polish, Lithuanian Commonwealth. And to the East, you have completely different culture. You have the Ottoman Empire, you have the Crimean Khanate, uh, the Mongolia Tatars. So it's completely different lifestyle, completely different religion. And Ukraine has always been, you know, right in the middle of it. And if you read Ukrainian literature from that period, again, I would encourage you all to read Taras Bulba by Gogol, incredible read. If you do not want to read, there is a great film with an uh, incredible cast. I, I will share it later about Taras Bulba. Uh, however, like from if, if you read the literature, Ukrainian literature of that time, you can clearly see that obviously, yes, um, as a Persian Cossacks were fickle, they would um, band up with Polish Lithuania against Ottomans, or like they would band up with Ottoman Empire against Polish Lithuania, or they would band up with Russians against everybody else. But the idea being, they the Cossacks really, really value their independence well, and it was a situation where they were like against them all. It's us, it's our tribe, it's us Cossacks against the world. So, and if you're against the world by yourself, time to time, you would need those alliances. Absolutely. Um, I would also like to add for the Jewish listeners, one of the main reasons that the Cossacks attacked the Jews was that the Jews were the tax collectors and the physical representatives of the Polish Lithuanian government. So um, while they couldn't attack, for example, the government in Warsaw or in Vilna, um, they could attack the Jewish tax collectors that were near them. And so that became sort of a proxy for that. Um, and so that's why in a lot of Jewish history, uh, there's a lot of negative association with the Cossacks because of this power, uh, this power relationship. All right. Uh, yeah, can I add, there was a question about yeah. Mazepa. Uh, you know, the dates that uh, represented uh, was the dates when he was the hetman, uh, but he was born in 1639, and it was in 1708 when he was displaced as hetman. That's when he sided with uh, uh, Charles XII of Sweden and participated uh, uh, in the Battle of Poltava, which is a major, major battle uh, in 1709 uh, in the summer. Uh, participated ag uh, uh, against Russians, and then eventually, uh, later on, he died. Um, uh, 
but uh, Ukraine stayed within the Russia uh, after that. Right. Now, one of the things that uh, Greg mentioned, and I think is actually worth taking a moment to sort of focus on, is that after the Russians forced the Mongols out of Russia, um, they had this fear that something from the east like the Mongols would come back. And so you have this massive Russian expansion. And you can see by this map, uh, all the different iterations of Russian expansion. Russians expanded from Moscow outwards. And so they took significant portions of land. This doesn't even get to, in the 1600s, how far into Siberia they expanded, right? Because by the 1700s, Russia already had expanded to the Pacific Ocean. Um, but you can see there's two general movements where Ukraine is concerned. There's a movement towards the West and there's a movement towards the South. Um, and so Ukraine comes right into the crosshairs of this Russian expansion. In particular, it's the fact that uh, Peter the Great, who became the ruler of Russia um, in 1682, uh, really wanted a warm water port. And eventually he gets a warm water port uh, in Northern Europe, that's St. Petersburg, you can see it on the picture there. But what he ends up really wanting is a warm water port in the south on the Black Sea, which means directly entering Ukraine. And Peter the Great transforms uh, Russia from being a sort of, let's say, Eastern uh, style state in the it was it had a lot more in common with uh, you know Mongol style of government to something a little bit more westernized um, but even still there's that uh, divide between uh, Russian culture and Western culture and as that expansion went on he had to remove the nobles the boyars and increase power um, more locally leading to numerous um, revolts from the established bureaucracy of course. The fact that he was moving into Ukraine also meant that he was attacking uh, the bureaucrats there. Finally, in 1696, he wins a battle um, against uh, the Crimean Khanate, which was a Muslim uh, government of Tatars, Turkic people who controlled Crimea. The Crimean Tatars still exist today. They're a minority in Crimea because of deportations since this point. But um, as the Russians were pushing further south, they created their first fortress, uh, Toganrog, um, which is in sovereign Russian territory today, uh, not very far from Mariupol, which you can see on the map on the Ukrainian side of the border. Um, and the Russians celebrate this battle of Azov, where they entered the Azov Sea um, to take Toganrog, and it became their first warm water port. This actually preceded St. Petersburg by about 10 years, 10, 15 years. Um, and it became sort of the central point that Russia wanted uh, Black Sea ports in order to be able to field their warm water navy. Do any of the panelists want to discuss a little bit about, about this or should we move forward? Just the official date of uh, uh, St. Petersburg's foundation is 1703. Nice. So uh, actually less than 10 years. All right. Now, as I mentioned, Russia is pushing down into Ukrainian territory. And so what we end up having, what we end up having is I want to compare these two maps side by side. If you look at the map on the right hand side, you can see um, this area that's sort of in a red outline with pink in the center. And unfortunately, I can only find one that's in Russian. Um, and it says Zaporozhye. That is the area of the Zaporozhian siege. You can also see if you compare that to the map of Ukraine on the left hand side, that's the area um, with only small Russian population, because those percentages are percentages of Russian population uh, in Ukraine, ethnic Russian population. But if you compare the areas that are um, in the Crimean Khanate, the areas that were part of the Russian Empire, that's that green area, you see that the Russian population is significantly larger. Another point to make is that the area in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that's that blue area, the Rzeczpospolita, if you can read the Russian, is almost all Ukrainian population, right? You don't have Russian settlement there because the Russians don't enter that area until a century later. So you can see the settlement population in modern Ukraine today parallels this exact history in terms of when those people were deposited. Hey, Richard? Yeah. A question, if you don't mind. Um, regarding this, this is obviously a modern map. Um, with these provinces in the East with these percentages, I, um, there's, also, there's a distinction between ethnic Russians and people who may speak Russian, but consider themselves Ukrainian. Sure. Um, I, I would say that 
I would actually say that those terms are not distinct. What I would say is the differences between Russian people who are Russian ethnically and people who are Russian nationals, right? People who believe that they are loyal to the Russian government. Um, and until 2014, um, I think that you can make a colorable claim that a significant percentage of Ukrainian citizens who are ethnic Russians in this region would have been in favor of becoming part of Russia. They would have been Russian nationals. With this current war uh, and the way that Russia has treated Ukraine, um, that sentiment has completely disappeared, um, more or less. Um, and so there's really no desire by ethnic Russian Ukrainian citizens to renounce Ukrainian nationality at this point. One other um, point I'd like to make and, and, and bring into this is that what the status of, of slavery and serfdom was. Uh, so at this point, uh, Russia, you could argue, was the world's largest uh, slave state. So out of 13 and a half, 14 million people as population between 13 and 14, uh, somewhere between 10 and 11 million were in essence owned people. Um, and then Peter the Great, 1723, converts or, you know, uh, Russia banned slavery and then converts them into serfdom. So basically writes a derivative contract uh, on it. And, you know, and then you have this slow um, diffusion of, of serfdom as a percentage of the population so that it gets to around 35 to 40% by the 1850s. Uh, but it is very, very slow because it's in essence generational. Um, and so th that's something to recognize because it, I think, frames um, uh, a record. It's very important to recognize the incredible Central Asian influences uh, when it comes to people, when it comes to uh, the power of the state, when it comes to resources um, that I think, you know, is, is there. And, and uh, I, I think that's something that is actually very much missed in the West when we study history. We get really trapped in sort of these um, paleographic figures and the Russian Revolution, and that's it, right? We don't recognize all these other forces that have been uh, you know, there for seven, 800 years. Absolutely. Now, there are sort of three questions that I'd like to quickly address. The first one is, what was the incentive for Russians to move into these areas? Basically, the Russian Empire had conquered these territories and displaced the people that were living there originally because they didn't want the Crimean Tatars uh, to continue being the majority area, a uh, majority of the people. And so they would induce Russians to move further south. And so they could only obviously do that in territories that they controlled, which is why these populations look this way. There's another question here as to uh, whether Putin is making the case that Russian language should be the basis of Russian identity in these areas. And that's absolutely the case, right? That elision that I, that, that separation that I'm making between a Russian national and a Russian ethnic person is not an elision that Putin is making. Um, and sorry, it's not a division that Putin is making. He's actually saying that they're the same thing, that if you are ethnic Russian, you should support the Russian state. Um, and so his argument has been that these areas should become part of Russia. And finally, there's a question of what is the Ukrainian language? The Ukrainian language is a language that is an Eastern Slavic language, just like Russian or Belarusian is an Eastern, are Eastern Slavic languages. There are some differences between Ukrainian and Russian. Um, so there are some people who speak only Ukrainian, some people who speak only Russian that can understand each other. Uh, but think of it like Spanish and Portuguese, where the differences are enough, that the majority of people can recognize you're speaking one, not the other. And there are a number of people who can't understand the other language. And finally, there's a question about um, what are boyars? Boyars uh, were the Russian nobility at the time. And, and, and I think this gets locked into this discussion uh, that I think the media and, and general news just doesn't uh, use the right language, but there's a difference between a revanchism and irredentism. So revanchism is like the political policy of, of regaining lost territory, whereas, um, <clears throat> irredentism is the doctrine, right? The philosophy of, of in essence, annexation uh, because there's historic uh, roots or ethnic roots or links, et cetera. And where this became really popular actually is in the 19th century in Italy, because obviously Italy was so well organized. Um, that's a joke. Uh, but, you know, that, that there were so many Italian speaking districts spread all over the place. And so there was a, a sort of an explosion of, of uh, irredentist policies 
uh, and or, or doctrines to try to construct policies to fuse together um, something akin to an Italian state. Um, so, so, so hopefully that helps people or it confuses you more. I don't know. So <laughs> I, I, may I make a, uh, my, uh, like a comments about the language, uh, because sure. my understanding. So, uh, during the Soviet times, and, uh, I can attest to that, uh, I, I lived there, uh, and I've been to Ukraine many times. I have relatives there. Uh, uh, the Russian language was a primary language through the whole Ukraine. Uh, uh, so all the administrative um, functions, uh, everything was done in Russian language. The uh, uh, everybody in Ukraine spoke Russian language. Uh, the Ukrainian language was taught as a secondary language, and uh, 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 again, people in the Western Ukraine were much more loyal, much more uh, uh, speaking uh, uh, Ukrainian language rather than people in the Middle and Eastern Ukraine. So. This started to change, of course, uh, uh, when the uh, Ukraine became an independent state, uh, uh, like over 30 years ago, uh, but uh, uh, very slowly, you know, and there is a question about the ethnic Russians and the Russian speaking people. It's, it's uh, very different because uh, a lot of Ukrainians uh, prior to 2014, uh, ethnically Ukrainians spoke only Russian and very little of Ukrainian. And I'm mostly talking about not about the Western part of the country, but the middle part. Like, for example, uh, let me tell you that I've been to Kiev in 2014, right after Maidan, uh, uh, like a few months after Maidan. Uh, and uh, Kiev uh, was a Russian speaking city. Uh, uh, you could say you could hear you know, Ukrainian speech there as well. Uh, but in, in my perception, it was mostly uh, Russian, maybe 80% Russian. I mean, it's definitely changed right now because now there is a more affiliation, there is a sense. Uh, and, and I agree with Richard with regards to uh, a lot of ethnic Russians right now in Ukrainian territory uh, consider themselves Ukrainian citizens and don't want to be part of Putin's Russia. Uh, uh, and, and so th this is very complicated situation. Putin uh, would love to, of course, extend it to all Russian speaking people, but uh, this is very confusing. I think he probably mostly means ethnic Russians and the area where, uh, as you showed, ethnic Russians are uh, prevailed, specifically Lugansk and Donetsk uh, uh, areas. Uh, where the Russian were uh, ethnic, uh, where uh, Russians were majority, um, but uh, uh, yeah, the language is a very complicated. It it is rapidly changing to more uh, Ukrainian use, and uh, more people uh, are speaking Ukrainian. Uh, for instance, you have to understand that this is. Uh, uh, the President Zelensky uh, uh, was a Russian-speaking uh, Ukrainian, uh, and uh, he was an actor who uh, played in the movies in Russian language, uh, uh, the movie that uh, the Servant of the People available on Netflix right now. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that. We have a slide. Outside. Right, right. This All is right, the, so... the well, Russian-speaking, uh, uh, you know, but now he is speaking Ukrainian only. Yeah. yeah. All right. So if we move a little bit further into the future, right, we've, we've left Peter the Great and the first settlements of what's now Ukraine by the Russians in the early 1700s, Ukraine becomes absorbed. As we mentioned in 1775, the siege is abolished and Ukraine becomes a territory of the Russian empire. But after World War I, you have this situation where Russia is not able to control the territories at the edges of its, uh, of its territory because of the Bolshevik revolution, right? That, and so you have this civil war that's going on in Russia. So the, the regions at, at the edge uh, begin to push for increased independence and autonomy. Um, um, so you have this first Ukrainian People's Republic, which is the first modern independent Ukrainian state, and it survives for only three years, right, until the Bolshevik Revolution uh, sends its military and conquers it. That's actually what happened, the same thing in Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, in the Baltics, they managed to stay independent, but um, most of these areas became reintegrated into the Soviet Union. And the point that's really interesting here 
is that um, the point that's really interesting here is that you can already see the symbols of modern Ukraine being used, right? You have the trident, uh, for example, um, and you can see in the lower right hand side, this is the first, uh, sorry, this is the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which ended the war between the Russians and the Germans, because the Russians pulled out of World War I um, when the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917. Um, and so the Germans uh, expanded their territory in terms of what they held in the East, and that allowed these states like Ukraine to uh, become more independent. Now, one of the interesting things is that Ukraine was not left alone during this non-Russian uh, non period. Uh, you also had Poland becoming an independent state. And Poland at that time was led by President Josip Piłsudski. You can see him on the right-hand side. President is sort of a euphemistic title. He was more like a generalissimo. Um, and his view was to create a large buffer state between the German empire in the West and the Russian empire in the East. Um, in order to prevent Poland from being cut up again. And so his view was to create a multinational state. Now, if you look at the map in, uh, of Poland, you can see a very dark burgundy area in the southeastern part of Poland. Those are Ukrainian areas that he annexed to his state uh, in between 1918 and 1922 um, in order to expand um, his Poland and create a larger buffer state. Now, if you look the areas to the northwest of that that are sort of in a lighter shade of burgundy those are areas with majority polish population so you can see that he annexes a lot of territory in the east both from what's today ukraine and what's today belarus in order to expand his polish state um uh, there's a question as to who ruled crimea right before catherine the great um the a crimean khanate uh ruled it um but yeah uh, which was a Turkic uh, group of people. Yeah, Tatars. The, yeah, Tatars. The Columbia, yeah. Um, does anybody want to sort of discuss this sort of interwar period and um, and Ukraine's first moments of independence or quasi-independence? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think this is um, really important to understand this uh, Western Eurasian use of these borderlands as buffers. And those buffers, and in and, and, and prior presentations, uh, one uh, that you just did the other day, Richard, on, uh, on the uh, um, Ottoman, uh, you know, Russian war number 13 uh, in the 1850s, uh, you know, the fact that there's this need for once Russia becomes a more modern and fully militarized state, uh, and then the Western European powers, uh, the English, you know, the French, um, you know, and the Ottomans really, uh, uh, from a Mediterranean perspective, uh, recognize that, that Russia is a, a player, uh, and obviously you have the Habsburgs too, but, but that recognize that Russia is a player there and that there needs to be these buffers, and this is all part of the Metternich peace, peace sort of view of the world to try to maintain peace, which was blown by, by World War I. But I think after World War I, smaller regional states start to look to try to create those same type of buffers. And we can't underestimate uh, what was going on, obviously, in Russia between you know, 19, uh, 16, 17, and all the way through the 1920s. And so and given the fact that, that, that Polish or Poland had been you know, partitioned and, and sort of disappeared uh, three, four times uh, already. Uh, the view was uh, we need to create some, some buffer land space and Ukraine sadly fits into that same range. And so I think that's something to, to never forget. Um, and, yeah. and there's, uh, anyway, so uh, I don't so, know if Greg or anyone else wants to, to, to dive in further. But. May I just, Richard, may I just circle back? I, I think uh, I'm, I'm reading the comments. There is a heated debate about language. And let me try to settle it once and for all. Language is just a way of communication, right? Language is much more, like language means 
how we express our thoughts in writing or verbally. And so you understand, I, I saw that the next slide was about Holodomor, but before that, there was a period when the Soviets had established them. Um, there was a group called Ukrainian Intelligentsia, which is sort of like Ukrainian Enlightenment, where you had poets, writers, uh, writing specifically in Ukrainian language, which was prohibited by the Soviets. And uh, guess what happened to them? They were either shot or sent to Siberia. So don't be surprised when you uh, discover that the most spoken language in Siberia, apart from Russian, is Ukrainian. And Ukrainian, so I, I, I assume not a lot of people in this chat speak Ukrainian and Russian, but I think the best comparison between Ukrainian and Russian would be Italian and German. So Italian is beautiful language with melody and uh, you can sing and it's, it's, it's what this language represents. So Italian is more like Ukrainian whether Russian is harsh, strict, we have the, a lot of rrr, sh sounds, so it's good for giving orders when you're on a battlefield, but it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a clash between languages that had, had been on, go, going, on, ongoing in perpetuity because people who wrote in Ukrainian were perceived as inferior which is not the case. If you read Ukrainian literature of that period, it's it's beautiful. It's it, it's great. You know the the amount. I, I I think there is a saying for like for for every Russian adjective, there are like three or four Ukrainian adjectives. And U Ukrainian to me, I I speak both. So as a context, I speak both. My first language is Russian, but Ukrainian is arguably just more beautiful. And in my humble opinion, I think Russians were just jealous. Um, Mark, you have your hand raised. Do you want to say something? Yeah, um, Richard, thank you. Do you mind going back to the, uh, the Polish map, the Second Republic? Uh, the Polish map, OK. Um, yeah, do you mind turning on your video? Say again? Yeah, sure, I can turn the video. Um, if you look at the southeastern corner, uh, where there was some Ukrainian population, um, when the Polish Republic was recreated after World War I, there were debates within the Poles whether they wanted to have an, an ethnically unified Poland or a multi-ethnic one like it had been before. And Pilsudski was, uh, he'd, he'd won out and it was the multi-ethnic um, model that went out. And in the Southeast, these are mostly Ukrainian populated areas, in, at least in the countryside. You'd have certain cities like Lemberg, Lvov, Lviv, the same one, uh, just three different names. That was mostly Polish and Jewish. I think, Richard, you could correct me yeah. uh, if I'm wrong. I think it's, I think it was up to a third Yiddish speaking Jews yes. in, in, in that city, especially during oh. under the Habsburg. Yeah, it was, um, was, was 17% uh, Yiddish speaking Jews over the entirety of Poland uh, during Piłsudski's reign. Okay. And what, um, so, and it, it, the Poles actually, um, suppressed um, Ukrainian nationalism during that during that period they had some problems and some 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 actual um, uh, fighting and the uh, just as the last one when um, the Poles the that island that Polish island of um, uh, Lvov I'll say it in Polish a lot of the Polish soldiers in World War II who fought under the British command were from that city and when that area went reverted to Ukrainian they didn't have a home to go to yeah, no, um, that's that's correct. Uh, and and I want to sort of comment a little bit on Daniel's sort of language war thing. Um, one of the one of the points that sort of comes up is like, if they just spoke Russian, like, wouldn't they be fine being under Russian rule? Um, and the language sure is a marker of different identity. But it's not the only marker of different identity. I think the aspirations of most Ukrainians in terms of the political allegiance of Ukraine, you know, towards the West as opposed to towards the East, these kinds of things make it that they're not actually the same people who just happen to speak a different language or the same people who've been co-opted, uh, you know, to, to want different things. These are two different groups of people with two different sets of aspirations. And I don't think the idea that um, they should be under one government because they speak the same language and they touch each other uh, makes sense. And we wouldn't imply that, for example, in Ireland, where most people in Ireland speak English before they speak Irish Gaelic. But 
none of us would say that Ireland should become part of Britain again just because uh, just because most Irish are English speakers. It, it, the the argument just doesn't work. And and, that and, and and I think something to 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 not forget uh, or or to be aware of is that um, a literacy in, in in Russia, given how uh, long they had uh, serfdom and how slowly uh, they went from serfdom to more modern sort of institutions. So you only had a literacy rate of around 25 to 30% at, at this time in the 1910s to, to early 20s in Russia, whereas in Ukraine, the literacy rate was three times as high. And so when you look at sort of evolution and language construction, um, you can see that uh, it's pretty linear across all language families. You see it between, and I always say this, that I speak American, um, not English. It's a, it's a, and I mean that actually. It, it, we, we use in the United States a much harsher, more slang ridden because we were uh, you know, late to the English uh, literacy race. And, um, you know, and obviously we've overcome a lot of it, but you don't, many times you don't overcome the idiosomatics um, because they work culturally. And so I think to follow up on a lot of what Daniel was saying, those, those idiosomatics really matter over generations, over, over hundreds of years. I mean, you can obviously yeah. <clears throat> have a no, revolution. If, if if we can move forward a little bit, right? Um, this is the Holodomor. Um, and the Holodomor, we should understand this as an intentional famine. Um, this is a point where in 1932 to 1933, you have the creation of these large scale farms uh, in Ukraine, the removal of the Ukrainian um, aristocracy is a strong word for it, maybe bourgeoisie called the Kulaks, um, who were killed in large numbers. And the farms that Ukraine has, and Ukraine is known for wheat growth, um, the wealth of this and the food quality was exported to Moscow, uh, and Ukrainians were dying. You can see uh, the numbers of uh, deaths in Ukraine uh, by month. And on the left side, you can see, this is a map that's uh, written in Ukrainian, um, and you can see in particular this the regions that had the highest amount of numbers of deaths uh, in black and the lightest numbers uh, in that sort of pink, but even the light ones in pink, we're talking about tens of thousands of deaths in those regions. So um, uh, in particular, you can see in the upper left-hand side, that's Kiev, um, uh, uh, Cherkasy and uh, Poltava. Um, so we have uh, Ukrainians really developed in addition to their national experiment from 1918 to 1920, they developed a sense of differentiation from the Russians because of the way that their livelihoods were uprooted during the whole of the war. Uh, does anybody sort of want to comment on this or? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, this was a direct consequence of uh, uh, collectivization that, um, and, and uh, uh, the Stalin uh, decided to stop uh, what uh, Lenin is told as a new economic pol uh, uh, policy uh, and, and start the collectivization. And that led to, um, uh, you know, this um, horrible consequences. So we're talking about millions of people who died uh, and uh, and actually, Russians were encouraged to repopulate later on uh, these areas, uh, ethnic yeah. Russians. Um, somebody mentioned Stalin in the in the comments. Yeah, uh, this was during the beginning of Stalin's reign, so this was a direct effect of Stalin uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Mark, you wanted to add something? Uh, if a question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, the I'm astounded some, sometimes by the Russian nationalists who just deny this whole thing happened, or deny that it was a a policy. They'll, they'll say things like, oh, lots of people starved in the Soviet Union. This is nothing special. And, and I'm curious, how, how is that equivalent to Holocaust denial? Um, no, I would say it's much closer to Armenian genocide denial. Yeah. Um, uh, Holocaust denial is usually that it didn't happen. Right. The, if you talk to the Holocaust denier, they'll say maybe 100,000 people died. There were there were diseases in the camps, you know, at the number six million is, is absurd, right? That That's Holocaust denial in a nutshell. Um, Armenian genocide denial is, oh, it totally happened, but there is a lot of really great reasons for it to have happened. 
Um, and it's much closer to that, right? Oh yeah, a lot of Ukrainians died during the Holodomor, but Russians were dying too, right? We had this, we had these mass programs under Stalin, lots of people were dying. There, like, there wasn't any intentionality to it when you can see that if you just took the amount of grain that Ukraine was growing and you just fed that to the Ukrainians, you wouldn't have had this famine at all, right? Yeah. Um, if you didn't right. remove the kulaks and execute them in large numbers, you wouldn't have had the level of disorganization in Ukraine that would have uh, that led to the Russians' ability to export that grain, right? Because without that sort of established leadership, then the Ukrainians had nobody to rally around, right? And they were repressed by Stalin's government and all these kinds of things. So the the whole Demor only works as a way to kill off large numbers of people if it is intentional uh, in terms of its execution style. Yeah. And, and, and I also, I, 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 I sort of view this as a fusion, right? It's sort of the Armenian genocide meets the great leap, great leap forward, right? So I always sort of view this as great leap forward 1.0 or the, you know, the, the MVP uh, where they basically attempt to sort of, um, collectivize and dehumanize the agricultural life cycle. Uh, in essence, just looking at human beings as sort of, um, you know, another physical or mechanical input. Um, and, you know, forgetting the fact that you're not beating nature and you're not beating humans needs to, 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 to be productive on the soil. And so there is sort of a fusion of these two things. And then, and then this, um, dynamic that goes on in modern Russian history, which is to love the uh, state survival stories, which are legitimate in some ways, you know, the, some of the World War II stories around, you know, uh, winning the war or doing the majority of the winning of the war in, in Europe. Um, and, and then sort of conflagrating all those other pieces of it and say, well, you know, that's sometimes the cost you have. Uh, versus looking at these as separate contingent events that, you know, human beings obviously have control over. Um, All right. So you can see under the, uh, if you look up actually at the upper right-hand side, you can see this is a street in Kharkiv uh, during the whole of the mortar. And you can see in, on the sidewalk, there are two people literally passing out um, from their lack of food, just dying of starvation. Um, so, um, and you can see that negativity towards the Russian control uh, manifesting during World War II, right? Because now we have this uh, opposite uh, force. You have Nazi Germany um, that is able to push Russia out of Ukraine. And there are certainly individuals, um, especially, uh, sorry, uh, Stepan Bandera, um, who lead uh, Ukrainians in sort of either creating an independent Ukraine or a nationalist Ukraine uh, in alliance, quasi-alliance with the Nazis. And you had positive receptions, especially in the westernmost parts of Ukraine, uh, towards the Nazi invasion, because they saw it as a way out of the Soviet system. Um, the pro-Nazi sentiment generally went down as time went on. And as we'll cover in the next slide, the pro-Soviet response um, in terms of numbers dwarfed the number uh, of pro-Nazi sympathizers. But when we see Putin making the argument that he's denazifying Ukraine, he's pulling upon this kind of imagery. Um, does anybody want to talk about this period in, in Ukrainian history, the sort of the pro-Nazi or pro-independence, uh, however you want to phrase this, uh, view of uh, Ukraine? Yeah, I can talk a, a little bit. Uh, so Stepan Bandera yeah, was a, a Ukrainian nationalist and uh, uh, he collaborated with uh, uh, Germans uh, up until a certain point. Uh, and, and that is, uh, became, made him a symbolic figure, uh, identifying him with Nazis. Uh, though when he declared the, wanted to declare the independence of Ukraine under German rule, uh, he was arrested by Germans and sent to concentration camp. Uh, however, uh, he, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, the Russian propaganda right now basically saying that there are elements from the Western Ukraine and specifically the uh, uh, battalion called Azov uh, uh, that committing genocide, that they're basically 
uh, controlling the government, controlling Zelensky, uh, uh, and doing. I mean, I mean, the propaganda in Russia is is horrendous. Uh, they're basically saying that all those pictures of uh, cities, um, uh, destroyed cities, are fake, uh, and, and uh, some of them are just being destroyed by the Nazis uh, just uh, for the show, uh, the, just to, to get an idea what what level of lies going on. Uh, in Russia right now, and and a lot of people do believe that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, but that's uh, uh, basically became a symbol of uh, 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 rights, uh, uh, you know, extreme rights nationalists. Uh, uh, Stepan Banderik, uh, you know, and uh, a, a lot of things are done uh, uh, against him, kind of his followers. Let me um, just add a couple of things. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Apologies. So, uh, uh, Stepan Bendera and uh, Shuhevich, um, you know, initially did, co you know, collaborate with Nazis, but Nazis had, um, or Germans had no, uh, it, you know, aspirations to make an independent Ukraine. They actually thought of Ukrainians and Russians as um, slaves. And that's that's the, what's the determination is. And in fact, um, you get this illusion at the end. So Ribbentrop, the minister, minister of propaganda in Germany had used um, Bandera as his ploy to then show like, look, I have this Ukrainians that collaborating with us and can fight on our side. And in fact, there was a, you know, a lot of Russian collaborators, like, for example, General Vlasov, who defected after being encircled um, to Germans. And there was a Russian battalion that's probably even you know much bigger than the Ukrainian battalion that fought um, you know, when uh, Polish were uh, trying to, um, you know, uh, break out from Germany in 1944 uh, on the German side. Uh, but Germans never be trusted Ukrainians or Russians and never used them in battlefield, uh, only used them as a police or, um, uh, or collaborators in, in the camps. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, it was never uh, something that, you know, that would have materialized in independent Ukraine. And he realized that and then start fighting against Germans obviously uh yeah i'm talking about Stepan bandera but in not not you know russian eyes he's considered to be they call it nazi uh, which is what he's they're calling ukrainians right now and they call this campaign denazification uh demilitarization of ukraine which is completely false they have a jewish president zelensky and therefore this completely debunks the whole you know idea that russia is trying to propose Thank you. I was going to ask, yeah. Daniel, could you sort of comment on how modern Ukrainians see uh, these sorts of leaders, uh, whether there's a division between East and West Ukraine in this perception? Um, what, what, uh, what, does, uh, what do these people represent to modern Ukrainians? To be completely honest with you, and again, uh, objective, this, so this period has been omitted in Ukrainian history book. It's not, you know, really being talked as much for you know obvious reasons uh, however you know even even let, let's talk even pre-2014 uh before even russia annexed crimea you know the the collaboration between you know the the, the, the government is in kiev which is you know center of ukraine and uh West of Ukraine has been always, always, always strong because you you have to think about cultural ties and to Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians in Kiev, like you would find like the most if, if you if you would open up your um, I don't know Wikipedia and Google Ukrainian, you would probably see pictures of Ukrainian from the western uh, western parts of Ukraine. So uh, we talk Lviv and we talk uh, pre-Carpathia and all of the regions that surround uh, Carpathian mountains. Um, my grandpa, he is from Kamenets-Padilsk, which is Khmelnytskaya Oblast. And actually it's not really black and white. And he was 11 when the World War II broke out. And actually, Nazi killing squads visited his village and just murdered all of the villagers. And he was he was just um, hiding, and that's how he survived. So it's not it's not all really black and white. And I would encourage you to think of 
Ukrainian Nazi collaboration, like um, collaborations that happened 400 years ago, uh, where we had Zaporozhian Cossacks collaborating with Ottoman Empire against Polish Lithuanian government, where the Cossacks collaborated with Polish Lithuania against Russia, or with Cossacks collaborated with Russia against them all. So it was not, it was just a means to an end, because Ukrainians had been, you know, oppressed, Ukrainian intelligentsia, you know, either sent to gulags or exterminated. And as you said, Richard, they were looking for this, you know, catalyst uh, for Stepan Bandera to, to propel them to like, create maybe an independent state. And if you go to, I, I, I would encourage, after the world ends, I would all encourage you to go to the Western Ukraine and, you know, think for yourself and make your own decisions and try their great cuisine, which is phenomenal. And actually, Stepan Bandera is considered as a hero, even, even up to this day. And as, as Aaron said, um, Putin uses, you know, one of the Putin's agenda and reasons for invading Ukraine is the de denazification. So he honestly thinks that there are Nazis in Ukraine, which is not true. At least I haven't seen them, and he he yeah. he Putin thinks of Stepan Bandera as as Nazi, and he he thinks that there are still Nazis in Ukraine. However, the case is it was just you know a one time deal for Ukrainians to gain their independence in the in the forties. Absolutely, yeah, and 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 a couple quick things to sort of not forget is that. Uh, there's a great book, a great historian, Timothy Snyder, that wrote about the bloodlands. Um, and we have to recognize that this whole region was the bloodlands. And um, and so you had, you know, roughly, I think the estimates are around 15 million people over a 12 to 15 year period were killed. And obviously tens of millions of people uh, were were forced uh, down, you know, radical uh, migration patterns and so on. And and you have to put this in context, like the Taiping Revolution, you know, a uh, rebellion. And uh, obviously that was uh, much bigger, three, four times bigger, probably in terms of death toll. Um, and so when you have this much destruction over a compressed period of time, uh, human beings just uh, think of just survival. And uh, it doesn't justify anything. And obviously, when you look back, you know, from a historical perspective, you recognize these decisions. Uh, but you know, one that no one really talks about is that the Finns, you know, in Finland, supported uh, versus the Finns in Sweden, right? Uh, the the you know the Finland supported uh, the Germans uh, uh, because obviously they were fighting a um, you know. A, a period of, of conflict with, uh, you know, with the with Soviet Union and Russia, and so, or SSR. And, uh, you know, so you had this, a, these strange bedfellows that were constructed uh, during that period. And uh, this was definitely one. I, I do think, and this is the last quick point here, that today's iteration of this, and I've spent a decent amount of time in Ukraine uh, doing IT work and working with, with people there for, for years in the, in the late 2000s and, and through the 2010s till about 2017, 18. Um, and I like soccer. And so um, going to a lot of football matches, especially in towards the East, um, the, the concept of an ultra, if any of you know that, uh, which are you know big in Italy and, and in, in many countries, the, this sort of fusion between ultraism and the right, the right wing nationalism and and a sort of local tribalism is very tight, and so you know I think you want to, for any of you that understand what that is, you you want to see that confluence and and generally speaking a lot of young men, uh, and so you want to see that confluence as the major population that's driving this, versus what you would see like in the West, like Kiwanis clubs, you know, or Boy Scout, Girl Scouts, you know, uh, you know, you don't have that type of infrastructure. Um, and, and so it's very different, um, you know, and, and I'll, I'll post a link here that goes into that a little bit, which for any of you, uh, you know, want to understand more. It, it, I mean, to be blunt, 
uh, you could say uh, Ukraine has had an own goal on this for 10, 20 years. They, they really should have taken a more German approach to this and really stamped this down uh, because it did create a lot of sort of negative feedback. Uh, and, and even Finland has, which I don't know if a lot of you know this, I'll put this link in here, that Finland finally dropped uh, two years ago uh, the swastika in, inside their Air Force uh, emblem, which is, uh, you know, obviously nobody was paying attention to that in the last <laughs> 70 years. But, Can I make uh, a quick, quick yeah. point about the uh, Nazi groups? I mean, there is a Nazi element in almost every country. There are some in the United States, as you know, extreme right nationalist uh, Nazis. There are some in, in Russia and there are some in, in Western Ukraine. Uh, you know, the main point of the Russian propaganda right now is distorting the reality. And there are some uh, footage and, and interviews with those Nazi elements in Western Ukraine that uh, are quite insignificant, but they, they do exist. Uh, and they, of course, participate in the defense and, and the Russians trying to present them a, as if they are dominating right. the whole government. That's the idea. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, before, just to close out this, uh, this, this portion, um, people have asked about the, uh, the two marches. Uh, the march in 1941 was to welcome the Nazi soldiers. The march on the right is by those who support Stepan Bandera. And that golden lion is his symbol. And so in the view of those who are worried about Stepan Bandera's connection with the Nazis about uh, that, uh, that return, that's similar to a pro-Nazi march. And that's sort of the connection that people are making. Um, but uh, as I pointed out before, um, the pro-Soviet side of Ukraine was significantly larger. We're talking about 4.5 million Ukrainians fought on the Soviet side of the war. And you have that being um, meant, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we have that sort of represented in a number of different uh, forces. Uh, and they weren't just fighting in the Soviet army. For example, we have uh, on the upper right hand side, you can see General Władysław Anders of the Polish army. Uh, he had uh, tens of thousands of Ukrainians in his forces. Ukrainians fought in the US forces and the British forces and the Canadian forces. Um, in fact, there's probably not one ally um, that fielded an army greater than um, 100,000 people that did not at least have some Ukrainian volunteers. Additionally, the largest segment of Ukrainians that fought fought as partisans. And so you can see in the lower right hand side, this was a village priest uh, in Ukraine who was awarded uh, from the Soviets um, uh, a second uh, a second class medal uh, for his work in fighting against uh, the Nazis in Ukraine. You also have, especially since uh, Ukrainian independence, an increasing uh, view towards the contextualization of the Holocaust in Ukraine. Um, for example, during the Soviet period, uh, you had Babinyar, which was the area where the largest number of Jews uh, died in a single event. It was 31,000 Jews, a little bit more, uh, died in this field. They were killed in one day um, by the uh, Einsatzgruppen, which was which were the deployment task forces of the Nazis. This was before the concentration camps became the dominant form of execution. Um, during the Soviet period, this was recognized as a place where Soviet citizens had died, uh, not as a place where Jews were intentionally exterminated. But the independent country of Ukraine has begun to recognize that it was Jews in particular who suffered. And so they created this modern memorial that you can see Zelensky offering um, a token of appreciation at. Um, you can also see the development within the Soviet military. Ukrainians were generally organized into Soviet units. They weren't ethnically or nationally separate. That said, there were several nationally separate units for a minority of Ukrainians in the Soviet military, uh, the first through fourth Ukrainian fronts. And this is a picture of the first Ukrainian front. Uh, that flag is still uh, in Kiev uh, that represents uh, the Ukrainian front. Uh, do any of our panelists want to comment um, on, uh, on this period? OK. Um, yeah, and uh, Daniel mentions that uh, Babinyar was uh, destroyed by bombardment a week ago. Um, yeah. So Richard, just to just to clarify, uh, that picture with Zelensky on the bottom left, you mentioned a memorial near Kiev. So I'm actually not familiar with that. I think it's more. No, no, no. no. It's a memorial at Babinyar. 
Oh, in, in Kiev. So because, so there is an actual Babin Yar uh, in Kiev, which is kind of like a valley where, you know, the, the Jewish population was slayed in World War II when the Nazis occupied Kiev. So uh, when I said Babin Yar Memorial in Kiev was destroyed in bombardment, I, I was referring to that one. I'm, yes. not I'm not sure if, because I, I think they, uh, to honor like an, an anniversary, anniversary to, to, yeah. to, to honor that, I think they created a second one near Kiev. And I think that one is still intact, but do not quote me on that because I, I have not been to Kiev in, in eight years. Yeah. Daniel, can, can I ask you uh, to comment on your shirt? That's a national oh, Ukrainian this shirt. This is a uh, traditional yeah. Ukrainian garb called uh, Vishivanka. Uh, this is um, this is new pizzazz. This is new. Um, <laughs> this is new fashion. Uh, this actually belonged to my grandpa, and it's quite too big for me. But um, I thought it would be appropriate to wear it. It, it looks nice, and it's apropos. Thanks. So, um, hey Richard, why don't you unshare your screen for just a moment so Daniel can pull up his shirt because it's hard to see because the um, video is so <laughs> small. On. We can do that during Q and A. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so after World War II, Ukraine became part of the Soviet Union again. It became Ukraine SSR. Um, and uh, the typical kind of oppression that you see throughout the Soviet Union was visited on Ukraine, nothing like the whole of the Mord where it was a specific anti-Ukrainian um, government apparatus, but it was a, a government apparatus that was repressive. You did have people being sent to the gulags, especially any of those who uh, demonstrated any Ukrainian nationalist tendencies. You had large scale industrialization uh, throughout uh, Southern Ukraine. Um, and you had the security state run by the FSB, right? The Soviet uh, secret services. Um, so it was a very difficult life, um, but it was difficult in the way that it was difficult for most Soviets at that time. All right. So it's important to sort of point out how Ukraine has changed territorially, let's say in the last 100 years, right? So if we look at um, Ukraine, it's expanded westward, right? It's taken on uh, territories that uh, were previously part of Poland or part of Slovakia or part of Moldova um, or Romania. Um, and so they, as it has acquired those territories. Crimea came into Ukraine from Russia, right? Um, you, uh, Crimea used to be a Russian territory, but during the reign of uh, Nikita Khrushchev uh, in Moscow, um, uh, it was given to Ukraine because it is a peninsula of Ukraine uh, in terms of the landmass. And so it made more sense from an organizational administrative perspective to give it to Ukraine, even if the majority of the population were Russian and it was an important uh, Russian center uh, in terms of the Black Sea fleet. Because when you're in the Soviet Union, it didn't make, a, it didn't make any distinctions. Of course, post-independence, when that territory became part of a sovereign and independent Ukraine, um, the fact that Khrushchev was ethnically Ukrainian, the fact that uh, the Black Sea Fleet is still at Sevastopol, which is a city on the Crimean Peninsula, um, all these things increased Russian nationalist fervor towards taking Ukraine and bringing it under Russian control out of Ukraine. One, one, one little point, by the way, he gave uh, Crimea to Ukraine, Khrushchev, in 1954, and that was to commemorate 300 years of unification. Uh, of Russia and Ukraine, because if you remember the uh, the agreement of the Pereyaslav uh, happened in 1654. Right. All right. So when Ukraine becomes independent, there becomes this very important question, right? You have in the wet in these five cities, along with a few others, but these are the five dominant ones. Uh, you have Russian. Uh, nuclear missiles based in Ukraine. And that makes sense, right? Ukraine is a forward position of the Soviet Union. So naturally, if you're going to have missiles aimed at the United States, if you're going to have them aimed at Western Europe, they should be based in Ukrainian territory. And that's exactly what happened. You had a lot of these missile carriers you can see in the upper left-hand side. And in 1994, Bill Clinton uh, manages to negotiate an agreement between uh, Russian President Boris Yeltsin and uh, Ukrainian President Kravchuk concerning the redeployment of these nuclear missiles to Russia uh, in exchange for Russia, the United States, 
uh, and I believe Western Europe, having security guarantees for Ukraine that Ukraine would remain territorial independent. And this is called the Budapest Memorandum, which was signed at the end of 1994. Does anybody in the panel want to comment a little bit on the Budapest Memorandum? The, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think one thing to recognize is that over three quarters of these were theater or what are termed as theater ballistic missiles. So they represent uh, the majority of arms control uh, that uh, the US and, the, and, and then the Soviets, uh, and then obviously the last uh, 30 years, the Russians, uh, which we've slowed down our ability to make progress on, on theater ballistic missiles. Uh, so in essence, the Russians, starting really in the early 2000s, have made a shift to recognize that the, um, the, the conventional imbalance is so substantial between uh, the US and, 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 and Russia itself that uh, maintaining a theater ballistic advantage is, is paramount. And at this point, the Russians have best estimates are somewhere on the order at a theater level, probably five to one um, advantage in theater ballistic missiles at the, the, the collapse of the last uh, generation of START uh, agreements and the inability to, to, to get new uh, nuclear arms control agreements. Um, we've, we've basically, I would say mostly maxed out the long range uh, uh, ballistic uh, missile treaties. Uh, I mean, you could, you could push them down more, but now you're getting to such a parity with others like China, India, uh, let's say maybe Israel, wink, wink, <laughs> um, that, that, uh, uh, that Russia and the United States will likely not do that unless there's a new generation, you know, historic generation of, uh, of arms control. So this is actually, I think, very important uh, for people to fully appreciate because, you know, there's a lot of nuclear talk uh, in the last month and the Russians have been experts at, um, let's say, nuclear talk for going on almost uh, 70, you know, let's say 60 plus years. Uh, and they've figured out um, that in the West, and I would say the, the global West, uh, culturally, we freak out every time they jump on the table and do sort of a Batman Joker, Riddler smile and, and laugh and say nuclear a lot. Uh, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily translate into uh, actions, you know, because the actions count in the end, which is moving mobile, in their case, moving mobile launchers around. Because that's that's what really matters at the end of the day, and so you don't see that connection um, because they they do recognize that that changes the escalation dynamics um, pretty radically, um, and so I don't know we can go into that later, but you know to keep it really simple, since we don't have theater of ballistic missiles in the United States, the 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 French and the and the English basically have some of those, the the UK have have I'd say a chunk of those. Um, that would force us to escalate to basically intercontinental. So it, it just changes the whole escalation dynamic because we have to basically go with our, our sub base launches. Absolutely. And then that, you know, and then that that gets out of hand, obviously, yeah. um, pretty quickly. So now one of the things that I sort of want to show is the development of Ukrainian dynamics after Ukrainian independence in terms of politics and organization. So in 2004, we have this period uh, sorry, in, from about 1990 till about 2014, we're operating in a certain uh, per, a paradigm where you have Ukrainians who are westward looking and generally are trying to speak more and more of the Ukrainian language and Ukrainians that are eastward looking and generally more interested in an alliance with Russia. Um, and you can see from the vote in 2004 that almost all of those people who were eastward looking were living in those areas that used to be part of the Zaporozhian siege, used to be part of the uh, Crimean Khanate, um, and the parts that were part of the Ottoman Empire, the parts that were all settled um, by Russians moving south, right, or Cossacks moving south. And the areas that were part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, almost all of those um, uh, or part of the Hetmanate, uh, were those that voted for Yushchenko, who was more westward looking. Um, and so you have this very interesting situation where, um, politically speaking, Ukraine looks like um, 
Ukraine looks like a country that's actually divided along this sort of Russian-Polish divide. Um, but of course, that changes with the Euromaidan revolution in 2014. Um, and the Euromaidan revolution uh, is really a democratic, uh, or rather, a, a failure of democracy um, occurring because of Russian intervention. And so um, Viktor Yanukovych, quote, won the election. He was a pro-Russian candidate. Um, but in reality, um, the Ukrainians felt that this election had been stolen from them. And so they protested in Maidan Square against uh, Russian military incursions, uh, sorry, uh, against Ukrainian military incursions uh, by Yanukovych, supported by the Russians. And um, democracy won out. The Ukrainians were able to get their independence. Does anybody want to comment on Euromaidan? Yes, yes, please. Uh, interesting time. I was, I was there uh, during that year. So just so you all understand, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, pro-Russian, but he actually wanted to further Ukrainian alliance with the European Union. And there were talks about uh, trade treaties or some sort of However, uh, overnight, uh, the legend goes that he gets call from Putin and overnight he changes his decision, pulls out, which just infuriates people. And this is how the Euromaidan started it because Yanukovych was like, people wanted, and you can, you can even see European flags on, on this picture, European Union flags. So people, people were actually, and again, this is my perspective. I lived there during those times. People were fine with Yanukovych as long as he would further Ukrainian alliance with the European Union. But again, he pulled out last minute. People got infuriated. And Maidan is actually, <clears throat> you know, th th think of like the, the lawn uh, in DC uh, before the Capitol. It's kind of like, yeah, uh, it's that big, even bigger. So people started gathering and out of the 10 people, you had 100 and out of 100, you had 1,000. And that, you know, lasted over winter of 2013 to 2014, which eventually led to Viktor Yanukovych fleeing the country and going to Russia. Absolutely. And when Yanukovych went to Russia, uh, Petroshenko uh, was able to... Uh, uh, get the Ukrainian presidency and move in a more Western direction. Now, yeah, pri prior uh, prior to Petroshenko, there was a intermediate government, and uh, uh, that it was in that period when Putin grabbed uh, the uh, Crimea uh, before the election, because this, this there was the government was not entirely legitimate. It was like, uh, uh, and uh, that's when he grabbed yeah, the caretaker government. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and then Poroshenko was uh, uh, elected later on, uh, but the, uh, already the problem with uh, Lugansk Donetsk uh, was going full scale and, and, and the uh, Crimea was lost. Mm -hmm. All right, so there are a couple strategic things that I want to address uh, before we get to the Q&A. And the first one is that Moscow has always been worried about invasion. And they've been worried about invasion, I think, because of the Mongol uh, situation, but this is an invasion from the West. And you can see that there's a large plain uh, that really narrows as you get closer and closer to Germany. But in Poland, in Ukraine, it widens to the entire height of uh, Eastern Europe, and it's easily traversable. You can see the topographic map on the right-hand side where it's basically flat uh, throughout this entire area, which means that tanks can move effectively um, and uh, Russia wants to put the point at which that possible entryway can happen further and further west in order to prevent um, enemy forces from being able to move uh, quickly across um, central uh, central Ukraine. Uh, the Nazis did it quickly. Um, the, yeah, the Nazis did it quickly. And Napoleon. Napoleon did it quickly. Uh, and so this is a constant fear from Russia, uh, an invasion from the west. Uh, there was a quick question about how Poroshenko got power. There was an election. There was a legitimate election, and there was a vote for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, um, well, there's two things. One on the whole Euro 
by the movement because it was a what you would call a revolutionary um, protest movement. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think that was a lot of the making of this friction that exists between uh, the EU or uh, European states and the EU and uh, Russia with Ukraine. It's almost, uh, it shifted from a pure military uh, or sort of humanitarian um, depopulation version, which was in prior centuries to a purely political one until obviously recently uh, in the last month. And I think that was this making of this dynamics uh, between the EU and Russia. And, and to be honest, the response from the EU, you know, was never, um, it, it was never fully welcoming Ukraine as a full state into the EU uh, or attempting to, um, you know, even a place like Moldova is arguably uh, more, has been more welcomed uh, at a sort of a technical, you know, it's what's called the ascension process in the EU at, a, at an ascension level. And it all boils down to the Russian dynamics, right? The, the, Euro, you know, the European states um, don't have an answer uh, on how to deal with a revanchist, more authoritarian, uh, more militaristic Russia on their borders. And so the simplest answer is, don't antagonize, don't engage, ignore the problem. You know, basically the root of most um, failed marriages is basically the, the, the construct of what uh, uh, goes on or has gone on. And, and I would argue, uh, I give it a 50-50 that it'll go back to, to, to that steady state. Uh, I know that's not what maybe people want to hear or what people assume, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you're already seeing some of those fissures uh, in Europe, um, so. All right, so now we talked about the situation uh, in terms of invasion. Um, the possibility, of course, always existed um, for uh, the growth of NATO and, and NATO, you can see, has moved further and further eastward, uh, closer to Moscow. Moscow has tried to uh, counterbalance this with their own uh, uh, organization, the CSTO, of which Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan are all members. But you can see Ukraine on this map in that very crucial geopolitical position, um, it, geostrategic position, uh, is a neutral party. And Russia um, deeply wants them to be part of the CSTO, while increasingly, especially after Euromaidan, Ukraine is looking closer and closer to Europe uh, for its security guarantees. Yeah, and, and, and I think when we talk about NATO, I think we need to be very clear about what we mean. Um, so, you know, NATO is a, um, in essence, a management organization uh, to manage the security and defense of its members. Um, and you could say there was original NATO, OG NATO, right, which is the NATO of the 1950s, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then there's this more expansive NATO, the NATO of the, of the post-Cold uh, post uh, War. Yeah, the, of, the, of the end of the Soviet period of, of let's say, the Cold War. Um, you know, now, there's another uh, reason that we have expansion. Um, uh, we, we have Ukraine uh, being more of an issue is that Russia uh, gets over 50% of its tax revenues from the exportation of, um, of, ener of the energy sector. Um, it's over 54%, uh, sorry, it's the energy sector is also nearly 70% of Russia's exports uh, and it adds a significant uh, chunk to its GDP. Um, uh, uh, around 30% is from power. So you can imagine how, how important this sector is to Russia. And if you look at a lot of the pipelines, a lot of the pipelines flow through Ukraine, which of course during the Soviet period was not a problem. That was still part of the same state. But now Ukraine is charging tolls on that. And so Russia has been busy building uh, these lines that now go through Belarus, that go under the North Sea and, and go under the Black Sea, anything to circumvent uh, Ukraine so they don't have to pay uh, these kinds of tolls, and I think energy is uh, is part of the rationale for this uh, for this action. You can Absolutely. also see that um, there are 
uh, oil deposits within Ukraine, both in, in the westernmost regions and in the easternmost regions, as well as under the Black Sea between Crimea and Odessa. Um, and Russia would have a direct competitor in Ukraine uh, for providing Europe uh, oil and gas if these become developed. And in fact, Russia has actively worked to make the shale deposits in the east unusable because of the 2019 conflict in the Donbass. Um, and European institutions were hesitant in 2012 uh, to build on the shale gas deposits. In 2014, because of Euromaidan, a lot of them pulled out because they considered the country too unstable. Um, and so this war could be seen as an effective way to keep Ukraine out of the energy market. Yeah. And, and, and one other quick point about shale, I think it's very important to understand this. It's uh, for those of you that have uh, heard about it or um, uh, have studied it in the last you know, 15, 20 years, uh, especially given the, the US and, 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 and Qatar uh, becoming in essence shale superpowers, um, shale is unique in that it allows a much faster development process. So under normal large rig digging, three to 10 years, depends on the complexity. Shale, uh, you can start getting a real production going in three to 10 months. Uh, so there's a, a substantial, I would argue this is a you know, colossal mistake in the EU and that they didn't, especially the Western region shale, they didn't develop it sooner. And I understand why, because of the, of the Green New Deal and so on, but it, it, th they never developed that hedge. Um, and uh, you could argue that Nord Stream 2 was really almost a, a, a version of not having to do that in, in, in continental Europe or what they call continental Europe, basically. Yeah. Oh, can I make um, a couple of points about the uh, NATO expansion? Uh, sure. uh, because it's a major sticking point uh, for Russians. Uh, uh, and if you know, in negotiations before this invasion uh, was about the Putin uh, made demands that uh, they would pull off completely of the Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, every Russian, uh, basically, if you start arguing about this, uh, would talk about the Russian grievances about the NATO expansion specifically, yeah. that uh, uh, they're saying that there was a uh, uh, verbal agreement between uh, Gorbachev uh, and uh, I believe it was Clinton at the time. Uh, uh, it, it was a, uh, a verbal agreement uh, uh, about the reunification uh, of uh, Germany and the Berlin Wall uh, collapse that supposedly uh, the uh, Americans promised, gave a verbal promise to Gorbachev that NATO will not move even one inch, inch to the east. And that was uh, uh, actually uh, uh, confirmed in the interview uh, by a very famous uh, Russian uh, journalist, Vladimir Posner, interview with Gorbachev that's, uh, I don't know, it was like maybe 10 years ago, where Gorbachev confirmed that. And that's what Russians are basically, it was, uh, there was no uh, official agreements or anything. I know that James Baker uh, uh, refuted that. He, he said, yeah. no, it didn't happen, you know, but uh, so you understand where the Russian, because all Russians are absolutely believe that it was some kind of gentleman's agreement that West violated. Uh, you know, I, I am personally of the opinion, knowing uh, how much abuse the Eastern Euphrates, uh, Europe suffered from uh, Soviet Union, uh, that uh, they naturally wanted to join NATO uh, for protection, uh, uh, and, and NATO couldn't uh, say no. Uh, yeah. But it, it's a question. But just want to understand where the Russians are coming from, because they absolutely believe that there was an agreement, uh, and, and, and Gorbachev did say it in the interview, uh, that there was a verbal agreement. I don't know how much that's worth, but it appears. Yeah, so, so to, to build on, on Greg, I think what's really important here, and we, we don't, we just forget about this, but that East and West Germany were separate. And the Germans, as the wall fell, because it was the wall itself between East and West Germany, and when we say the wall, um, that Germany wanted to have a reunification. Um, and obviously, um, uh, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, which was still technically, uh, it still existed at that point uh, for another year or so, um, 
they were concerned about Germany rearming and more importantly, becoming in essence, a, you know, let's say a NATO superpower. Uh, and so the discussion really, if we're going to be honest and objective about it is, was built around the rubric of that reunification. And so I think to be sort of fair and objective about it, I think the broadest understanding is that uh, we were willing, and the Germans under Kohl at that point, the West Germans, I should say, um, were willing to really say anything to uh, allow Germany to have its reunification. And I believe part of that saying anything concerned a German NATO expansion, right? I think that was the vantage point of, of, of sort of the Soviets and the Russians. They, they didn't think of Estonia. They didn't think of... of uh, of Moldova as being of, of, of paramount concern. They were concerned in the World War II German context of a rearmed superpower that would now become basically a peer adversary uh, in Europe uh, with Russia. And, um, and if, you, if we're gonna be really fair about it, we sort of blew all this off in the 90s, um, to just to be honest. And, um, and we got a revanchist uh, um, a leader in Russia who, in essence, kind of brought all that back up in the 2000s. And we just haven't been able to reconcile that. And ultimately, I believe what Putin is attempting to do and, and the Russian leadership, I make this larger than Putin because it is larger than Putin. Because I think everyone believes Putin goes away, all these problems go away. Maybe the Ukrainian part of the conflict goes away but the larger issues don't go away. And the larger issues is they basically want to renegotiate the European security architecture going forward in the 21st century for, the, for at least the next, let's say 30 to 50 years. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. And so, however, this conflict resolves itself, that doesn't change. The Russians will continue to want to renegotiate this architecture. And at the end, the Europeans through us, the United States, are gonna to have to somehow square that circle with the Russians some point, whether it's six months from now or 12 years from now, at some point, something's gonna to have to give in that. Now, um, there's another part that I wanna sort of bring up in terms of the strategic reasons for Russia's invasion. And when Ukraine, I'm sorry, when Russia took um, Crimea from Ukraine in 2014, the Ukrainians cut off the North Crimean Canal. You can see illustrated uh, by this image uh, on the right-hand side, and in terms of its map position by the left-hand side. And the North Crimean Canal connects uh, the, the Dnieper River um, to Crimea, because Crimea is basically a salt flat. Uh, it's, it has no water of its own. It has no major rivers. Um, and so this canal was constructed in order to bring water uh, from Ukraine, which of course has significant amounts of water as well irrigated, as we pointed out, it's a breadbasket, uh, to Crimea. When, uh, when Crimea was annexed by Russia, and therefore it was an independent, an independent country, um, the Ukrainians cut off the water. And so you ended up with these very shallow um, resulting uh, areas in the North Crimean Canal. Um, prior to uh, the Russian invasion, uh, the uh, the reservoirs in Crimea were at seven percent of total capacity, which should show you how cl how close they were to dying off. Um, and one of the first things that the Russians did when they invaded the city of Kherson, which is very close to that Nova uh, Nova uh, Kakhovka on the map, was that they blasted open um, the blockade that the Ukrainians had put in order to get water flowing back uh, into Crimea here. Yeah, and 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 to build on this. Um, at a strategic or geostrategic standpoint, uh, southern Ukraine and Crimea and, and Sevastopol are absolutely fundamentally strategic to Russia. And this goes back to 1783, you know, the, the three great admirals, probably one of the greatest admirals in history, you know, just the whole um, codification of, of, of the ability of Russia to project global power. Uh, I would argue this is the equivalent of Hawaii and Pearl Harbor to the United States and its ability to project power into the Pacific. Uh, and the Russians view this, and I, I would argue they're only going to reinforce this view, especially given that they've uh, had a, you know, obviously at this point, a catastrophic uh, destruction of land forces, primarily through light combined arms, 
uh, which was always their fear, right? Their, their fear is they could never compete with the originally, they believe just the United States and maybe some of the far Western allies like the UK and the French. But the idea that a, you know, fairly lightly trained, um, you know, near Russia force can do a lot of, you know, let's say combined arms on the cheap sort of proves the point that Russia's ability to rearm itself and retrain itself will have to be a generational effort. And they can't afford to do that on land because it takes time. And so they're going to have to shift to other power. And that's going to clearly be uh, nuclear. It's going to be a uh, sea ballistic, et cetera, because that's something they actually can do. Um, now, you're, you're surrounding, you're talking about, uh, you know, the Black Sea position is critical in terms of you, if you see where Putin's troops were disposed uh, before February of the February 24th, when the invasion began, you can see the troop positions were in Russia proper in uh, occupied Crimea and in Belarus. And you can see that there's the alliance, right, between uh, Vladimir Putin and Alexander Lukashenko, the quote, president, end quote, of, uh, of Belarus. And you can see Vladimir Zelensky. This is just before um, the invasion happened. Uh, and the picture of Vladimir Zelensky is from his address to the Russians, um, the Russian people on the 23rd of February, trying to avoid uh, the invasion. Um, there's a question about the, the links for safekeeping. The easiest way to use the links, just click on them. Uh, they'll open them up in your um, Microsoft Edge or, or Firefox or uh, Opera, whatever your web browser, Chrome, whatever your web browser is, and then you'll have it in your history. That's the easiest way to save the links. Um, so we get to the invasion and of course, uh, people are, are all excited about who this guy is. Um, you can see he starred in a TV show called Servant of the People where, um, you know, a down on his luck, normal person uh, claiming to oppose corruption, uh, gets elected to the presidency of Ukraine on a promise uh, to end corruption. And then you can see the real uh, person uh, who's a common person in Ukraine, uh, vote, uh, runs on an election to oppose corruption, gets elected on a premise to oppose corruption and becomes president of Ukraine. So you can see life had absolutely nothing to do with this artistic portrayal um, uh, and sort of creating his image. But in the same time, uh, as president during this wartime period, he's made sure to wear fatigues, uh, to look like he's uh, in there with the soldiers. That's not to say that he isn't, but he's definitely making that appearance and I think it's really important to point out how effective Zelensky has been from a marketing perspective in terms of creating this Ukrainian solidarity and creating this image of, of fighting and defending his homeland, very similarly to the way that Churchill, uh, you know, had his, you know, they will bomb us in the, in the streets, uh, we will never surrender kind of speech. I think Zelensky has really figured out how to Instagram uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of momentum. And uh, yes, as people are pointing out, you can see the servant of the people on Netflix now. Um, so they say they're going to address Oscar <laughs> today. Um, there's a question of why did Putin wait until now? Um, I, I think we can cover that in the in the period. Um, so. We also have to discuss uh, Russian's foreign policy and Russian's foreign policy with regards to the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union um, uh, has to do with destabilizing any of the post-Soviet countries that have a westward orientation. And we can see that uh, with the way that they've uh, created Transnistria in Moldova, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia in Georgia, uh, supported Armenia's Nagorno-Karabakh region in Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is even only partially Western-leaning, and the creation of these two separatist regions, Crimea and Donetsk-Luhansk, uh, in Ukraine. And you even see Russian intervention in pro-Russian uh, uh, former Soviet states, like uh, when there was when there were protests against Tokayev in Kazakhstan in this January. Russian troops, along with other troops from the CSTO, were sent uh, to Kazakhstan. Um, so this has been part of Russia's coordinated foreign policy to keep uh, countries from being able to become effective Western allies uh, because they're too busy dealing with their own internal issues. Does anybody sort of want to comment on this uh, foreign policy of Russia? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think 
um, if we're going to be really sort of objective about it, this is their version of the Monroe Doctrine, um, you know, within their region. Uh, so if you look at the sort of spheres of influence, 19th century sort of, you know, thinking to, to through the, let's say, first half of the 20th century or, or so, it was this idea that um, everything within the Americas was the purview sphere of influence, north south, you know, hemispheric of uh, of the United States, um, and this is a sort of you know modern uh, Russian rendition of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and to be really honest, um, uh, you know, most people probably wouldn't like this, but if he didn't choose Ukraine and picked almost any other state, I don't think most people would have cared. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's morally. Well, I mean, I remember in 2008, um, I was doing question and answer site uh, stuff. And when Putin invaded Georgia in 2008, right, uh, I had people literally ask some questions. How far from Atlanta? How come I'm not seeing tanks? I live in Savannah. Uh, I live in Atlanta. Like, what's going on here? Um, So, and uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, geography 101 for Americans. Um, so it's, anyway. it's everyone in the world now because everyone's <laughs> social media. So, so that, that's the one advantage. We've exported it everywhere. The disease yeah. is global. So this, um, is, this is the invasion map from the 5th of March. You can see um, that some things have changed, especially concretization in the southeastern area. Uh, but generally speaking, um, the forces are in roughly the same position because of the Ukrainians' ability to target using light arms uh, the Russian military advances. Yeah. And, and I would say one just fortunate thing by Ukrainian, I mean, it's fortunate, unfortunate simultaneously because the population is suffering, obviously, to a horrible degree, is that by the Ukraine having so many cities, including most of which people haven't heard of, but, you know, cities with 100,000 uh, people or more, uh, the Russians have nowhere near the forces uh, to take uh, any of these cities. And if you can remember back to the Iraq invasion uh, and and the subsequent, you know, first five to seven years after it, um, you know, you took a place like Fallujah and it took the United States two tries and the second try basically, you know, 20,000 to 30,000 troops uh, to take a small, barely a city, Uh, you know. So if you think of the scale and the United States has combined arms. And so if you think of the scale of these cities, um, the Russians would have to literally forklift, uh, you know, 10% of its population there uh, to stand a chance. And so, you know, the, these cities offer these huge defensive uh, positions uh, and uh, really constrain what the Russians can do, uh, ultimately. Uh, and of course, that's why they're going to bombard, starve, cordon, etc., so there, are, and so uh, we finally got into the Q and A section. Um, yeah. uh, Robert says we only have twenty minutes, so let's all boo okay. him out of the room, um, yes. so we can so we can keep talking forever. So Robert um, has twenty minutes. Uh, Robert has twenty no, minutes. The rest of us, you know, we have all day. You know, <laughs> yeah. Robert, I mean, F one starting, so you can just watch F one in the background, and away you go. <laughs> so anyway, um, one of the questions that kept coming up um, is why did uh, the invasion take place now, not while Trump was in office. And and I think that the key answer, and, and if our panelists want to dwell on this, I, I mean, I don't think we should, but if our panelists want to dwell on this, um, the thing is, is that during Trump's era, NATO was a very weak institution. There was a lot of pressure against it from the Trump administration, feeling that the Western European countries weren't pulling their due and fearing that an invasion of Ukraine might bolster NATO, which is exactly what it did. Um, I think Putin held off for as long as Trump was in power and was waiting for um, Trump to win the re-election and then continue um, weakening NATO. I think that's, I think that was really his thought process. Remember, he did invade the Donbass under Trump's administration. So it's not like he didn't do anything. He just didn't lead a full uh, fledged invasion. Yeah, no, I I completely agree with that. I I think, uh, you know, it's just uh, history so contingent. So you get these weird situations, which maybe don't make everybody feel good. (laughs) But you know, there's there's some reality to this, uh, that I think, uh, at the end of the day, Trump's pressure and and the whole administration's pressure, Pompeo, et cetera. And I always try to elevate this beyond like the single leader has a magic button, like a South Park episode, because it's just not like that. They have, you know, thousands of of people that that work under them and that 
have similar beliefs or even more extreme beliefs. Um, and, and my view is there was so much pressure being brought to, to bear against the European allies and this big shift, which, you know, has really began under Obama to, you know, shift to Asia, shift to China, et cetera, which sort of got amplified under Trump too. So I, I just think those dynamics um, represented a, a, a lack of need for the Russians to escalate. Um, they were just looking to basically split the baby, right? The Europeans weren't supporting the, the Ukrainians. I mean, let's just be blunt here. Uh, they were actually working against them, right? They, they cut these uh, gas line deals, which were devastating really to the Ukrainian economy. Um, now, Greg, you, you mentioned could, you might yeah. want to say something about this. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, did I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Never mind. I, that, no, that's I, fine. We can I, move I, on to I, another I, question. I, I would rather. I would rather. I would, what I wanted to say. I would rather about like the second question from the if uh, without NATO boots on the ground. I think that the Ukrainian army cannot defeat Russian army, but they could create a stalemate, and the 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 time doesn't work. Uh, for Russia, because they, uh, uh, the, it takes time for the sanctions to take uh, to bite. So uh, that, that's one of the things. But I, I also, my general opinion, that I think the Western media uh, uh, includes a lot of wishful thinking, and there is a lot of favorable uh, analysis to how the where Ukrainian stands, and I think they underestimate uh, the capacity of Russia to sustain and, and expand this campaign. Unfortunately, you know that's uh, very much undermined in Western media. Uh, it's a big country; it has a lot more resources, uh, and and uh, uh, I, I'm I'm a little bit surprised that people, but uh, uh, don't don't re realize that, and uh, nobody talks about it. However, I don't know, maybe. Uh, Putin will be compelled at some point to stop. I, I hope yeah. so, but who knows? He, yeah. He, and, and, he, and, yeah. Yeah. he cannot okay. hold Ukraine. He cannot hold exactly. because of the insurgency, but he, he probably have enough forces to overrun it. Uh, yeah. unless, and, and I will, yeah, and I'll make it very clear since you can't go on amazon.com and buy NATO boots. There are no such thing as NATO boots, right? So these are individual countries that contribute forces to the NATO alliance and the NATO alliance assigns those as either uh, combined or as individual forces. So we have to be, I know nobody really wants to maybe get into the weeds here, but that's actually very important because you, you just can't call up NATO troops. It doesn't exist, right? You, you have contributions from, from states and they have separate policies on the use of these uh, troops. I, I don't see outside of, um, you know, uh, at the most extreme, some humanitarian medical forces on the, that would be the most lightly, they would, they'd have to be unarmed NATO uh, medical forces that would go in, you know, from, from, from the medical force command um, right. um, that, would, that so, would go in. So let's, um, there was one question that I wanted to answer quickly. Um, uh, there's uh, if you if Putin were to take over Ukraine, would Ukrainian become a secret language? I don't think that that there's uh, that it's possible now. But in Belarus, for example, Belarusian is a language that is directly repressed by Lukashenko, um, yep. and people are thrown in jail for speaking Belarusian uh, the Belarusian language in Belarus. So uh, it's not entirely beyond the pale of possibility, but I don't think it's likely because of how many people speak Ukrainian as a dominant language now. Yep. Now, one other question I wanted to ask before we get to the questions that have been asked by the audience is. Um, uh, Daniel and I have spoken separately about his work with NGOs like MSF um, in terms of ways to help the Ukrainian people who are suffering uh, through this situation. And I was curious, Daniel, if you want to talk uh, like for a few minutes about where people can uh, where people can send their money or what kinds of other uh, donations they can give in terms of time or energy uh, towards helping people in Ukraine. Sure. Uh, first and foremost, do not, and I mean that, do not engage with the International Red Cross Committee because from what I'm hearing from my friends and family who are still in Ukraine, the International Red Cross Committee is, has done absolutely nothing in the month um, that the war has started to support Ukraine, apart from just like drag, dragging dead bodies from one pile to another. And apparently, and 
apparently leadership at the International Red Cross Committee has been very shady, as in they did not disclose their taxes for the last year. And apparently they funnel all of their monies into like buying cars and, um, you know, properties and yada, yada, yada. I will send a link with you. So it's, it's a link that has been shared with me. There are a lot of great nonprofits. And again, although I do represent Doctors Without Borders, I am not, for, for, for the sake of this presentation, I would not advocate for them. And I would encourage you to just to give to a nonprofit of your choice and the nonprofit that you trust, because not only, I know my organization has um, missions in Ukraine, but also does the International Rescue Committee and the other resources. However, um, if this is, if you're really smart, I would encourage you to donate directly. I know there are a lot of, I, I assume there are a lot of, there, <laughs> I assume there are a lot of Jewish uh, population listening to this presentation. So I would encourage you to donate to your local communities uh, with ties to Ukraine. Um, I, I, I know there is this one that you can like, what, what's it called? Build a brick or like donate for a brick and um, you know, and it, it, it would help. So think of ways, because if you do donate to a nonprofit, for instance, at our organization, we spent, in order to raise one dollar, we spend thirteen cents, which is you know thirteen percent of revenue. If you do want to help directly and multiply your efforts, just I I for sure know that the majority of people listening to this presentation have either friends or families. Just help them directly, uh, share the resources and. Think, th think also this way, a lot of Ukrainians are fleeing right now, and a lot of Ukrainians are lost and cashless, and then they didn't even know, you know, the immigration process. A lot of Ukrainians, although very intelligent, do not speak English, so maybe it would be a hurdle for them, and they would need information on how to immigrate, uh, what to do, what 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 documents bring with them so maybe you can help with that just you know d direct direct marketing as they call it um does it answer the question yeah i think it does so uh well, one other thing richard I, I think that that might be good too is that for most of you here listening in the either western europe or, or in the united states canada etc there are in your state or province, there are obviously large uh, generational migrations of Ukrainians over the last 30, 50, 70 years. Most of them have their own uh, pre-existing support organizations. So just doing a Google search or whatever you know, search you use to where you live and Ukrainian, um, you'll, you'll start pulling up some resources of local churches, local organizations, et cetera. And then, you know, they're all establishing for obvious reasons, uh, you know, basically little command posts out there, little CPs to help, you know, the, this process. And that that's a way to sort of, you know, maybe fuse to what, what Danielle was saying uh, in that, in that direct relationship. Okay. Uh, there's another, uh, one, uh, so uh, I've gotten a lot of the questions, uh, given our time constraint, I don't know how many we'll get to, but um, there's a question here about uh, the religious situation. So you've got uh, Patriarch Kirill uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow, and we've got the Autocephalus uh, Ukrainian Church, which was recognized in 2019, um, uh, and several different constituents of that church. To what extent- Richard, we'll go a few minutes over. Richard, we'll go a few minutes over. I'll give you a signal. Okay. Um, so to what extent um, is this a religious conflict? To what extent does religion play a, a role? And I'll start, and, and if the panelists want to join afterwards, they can. Um, my intuition here is that religion is a secondary part of this war. There's no religious reason that Putin is invading uh, Ukraine, um, even though there are churches that belong to what is at least formally the Russian uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine. That's not really the reason why it's going on. However, through the relationship between the church and the state um, as exists in the East, 
these churches are becoming representatives of their nations and uh, promoting the propaganda of both of their sides, right? The Ukrainian church is supporting Ukraine, the Russian church is sort of supporting Russia. And this is actually very common in Eastern Europe the, uh, with Orthodox churches being national representatives in terms of their political and social legitimacy. So that's what we're seeing. Um, and Patriarch Kirill's endorsement of Russia is not unique in Russian history. In fact, we see this throughout the Tsardom period. Um, what's, what's interesting about it is that the Ukrainians are seeing this and therefore saying, that's not my church. I'm not entirely sure what my church is. Maybe my church is the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, um, but the Russian Orthodox Church can't be my church because they're sending people to kill me, right? And that's the relationship that's really developing. If any of the panelists want to comment on that. Yeah, I would just add that, um, uh, yeah, Patriarch uh, of Moscow, Kirill, he is supporting Putin uh, uh, outright, uh, completely. Uh, and uh, uh, the only question, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, it's primarily non-religious uh, uh, war, uh, but uh, so there are theories that uh, maybe uh, Putin at this point, uh, uh, st- uh, with the help of uh, the Patriarch Kirill and, and the church, starts to believe in some messianic uh, message uh, uh, that that he, it's his destiny uh, uh, to go into history as a, a, a great uh, Russian, uh, 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 you know, leader who would expand and promote Russian interests. Yeah, and, and I would I would second this also, and I would really look at the demography at the survey level, right? So when you're looking at this 50 and over population or 60 and over population that acquired, let's say, the ability to worship at the end of, I mean, that they were already secretly doing it in, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but but that could do it openly in, in, starting in the 90s in Russia. Uh, you know that support base which is, I kind of call it, um, you know, it's like the TJ Maxx version of the Russian Imperialum, right? It's sort of like the discount edition, right? Which is, you know, some, some, some religion, some, some Russian iconography, some Russian, you know, military power, all sort of mixed up uh, together. Uh, that's a real powerful base that, that's still there. And, um, and that population isn't looking at day-to-day data. They're not looking at sort of international relations. They have a worldview um, that I think the only thing that will change that um, is when the policy changes, Um, even uh, having uh, casualties, uh, which will just reinforce the worldview, right? So I I think that's something people, I I think, discount, to be honest. I think they assume when the caskets come back, oh, everybody's going to go jump up into the street uh, I think the under 30 crowd is the majority of that. Um, and then obviously, let's say some uh, uh, familial relations of, of casualties that are 30s and 40s. I think a lot of people over 50 will still support the policy. Now, and I, I, Can I just one small comment? Uh, if you think that Russians will openly uh, you know, go protesting, you're, you're going to be disappointed. It's not going to happen. People who protest are, are, are uh, at great danger, and that is increasing incrementally. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, it will be completely suppressed very soon. So uh, it's uh, it's not going to happen. I can guarantee it. Yeah. Now, and, and the Russians. Uh, one last thing: the Russians have have sort of mastered in the last twenty years this sort of um, expulsion policy, right? You could argue the gulags cost a lot of resources. So they figured out, well, just ship people out. Yeah, you know, so let them pick a country and just go. And that's really kind of now the policy, really. It's you got 24, 48 hours, get all your crap together. You're on a plane to Tashkent, like whatever. You're you're not you're not gonna be right. in Moscow anymore. And right. that is a now I, I argue that's gonna scale actually as a policy. Yeah. Now um now there have been a couple questions about whether the division of Ukraine somehow between perhaps Eastern and Western Ukraine, between sort of a Novorossi and a Arichpospolita uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, that, that if there were some kind of mechanism, would that be a viable solution? Um, what, how do our, my intuition is uh, to sort of laugh at that, but uh, what I, I'm curious of what our panel uh, has to say about that. 
it would be a political suicide for any Ukrainian leader to accept that's that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I don't think it it can happen. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think look, there there's a reality that is uh, that that we're seeing in front of our face, which is Russian war aims are changing because the facts on the ground are dictating it, and. Uh, and, and, and the smaller war aims, which are arguably are the same aims that could have been achieved with 90% less losses in essence, uh, is basically where the Russians seem to be going. Uh, because if we're assuming most of the numbers right, which is somewhere between 30 to 40,000 uh, Russians have either been you know, killed, or severely wounded, captured, or deserted, which I think those are probably pretty accurate. Um, and they acquired basically most of what they could have acquired for probably 10% of that. Um, I think that's the plan they're shifting to. Uh, and they're looking to, at some point, say, you know, put a bow in it and call it, we won. And then the real test is going to be, how does, the, how, did, how does Europe, the US, Ukraine, et cetera, respond to this? Does it, does it shift into a full-blown insurgency or can uh, there be a deal? Because if there can't be a deal, then I think that's where what Greg was pointing out earlier, where the Russians will just kinetically escalate dramatically. Uh, and that's where we'll shift from the scale of this as a humanitarian crisis to really a catastrophe. Um, and I, I just think we don't know that answer. I mean, we're, I think in the next month to two, we're gonna find that out based on the facts on the ground. Now, if, if I may just quickly add, Richard, sure. to this question, look, war is hell. War creates suffering. And because of this conflict, we are seeing the largest humanitarian crisis in Europe since, I don't know, for how, how many years ago. The official numbers are three and a half million displaced Ukrainians, but we do know that this number in reality is much, much larger. Also, don't forget that Ukrainian males are not permitted to leave Ukraine, right. which means that who is fleeing Ukraine? Who are those three and a half million Ukrainians? They are women and children. And what do you have where you have unaccompanied females with children fleeing Ukraine with no cash. We talk yep. trafficking, we talk rape, we talk extortion and slavery. Ideally, this war has to end yesterday, month ago. And in my honest opinion, there is a way to it. If, if Russia wants to keep Luhansk and Donetsk, let them keep it. Let's divide Ukraine by a Dnipro River or let's give Russians Donetsk and Luhansk, but let's fast track Ukraine to European Union. Let's revitalize, revive, re-energize Ukrainian industries because the rocket that put Yuri Gagarin in space was made in Ukraine by Ukrainian scientists. The first, like the helicopters were made by Igor Sikorsky, a Kiev, Kiev scientist from Kiev who moved to California. Ukrainians, so a lot of tech companies actually outsource their labor and who does it? Ukrainians. Ukrainians are darn smart and there is a lot of potential to it. So if there is a deal, let, let Russians keep Donetsk, Luhansk and let Donetsk and Luhansk citizens decide for themselves if they wanna stay in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk under Russia or if they wanna move west. And let's just let's let's end this conflict once and for all, because every day it's even more and more suffering. I've I've seen I, I, I was part of the uh, Euromaidan in 2014. And during Euromaidan, um, 100 people died. I saw that with my own eyes. I was appalled by that. Now people are dying in thousands. And it's just. It's it's bad. It's, yeah. and, it's it's barbaric, and and I, and I would say and to to sort of build on that, and I think this is really important in the next uh, month, is that we have some very we're we're constructing some very uh, the all sides um, unhealthy 
negotiating dynamics, right? We're escalating. I'll put one in here. I'm sure this was a mistake, but you don't need these types of mistakes, right? So President Biden basically said that, you know, um, you know, Putin needs to be, uh, you know, cannot remain in power, right? So regime change is not exactly a great starting position for a negotiation. Um, and so I just think there's a lot of, of um, if, we're, if the goal is to create a negotiated settlement, which by the way, it's unclear to me if that's actually the goal. I, I know a lot of people in, in, in the civic world are saying that because you know we, we look at data and we look at history and everything gets to some settlement. But I think all the actors are not acting like they're attempting to construct a negotiated settlement right now. So we're, we're still in this live kinetic phase where everyone's attempting to drive an outcome on the battlefield. And I think until the Russians and I'd say the Ukrainians, and more importantly, everyone supporting the Ukrainians, the US, Poland, NATO, et cetera, and that's who is supporting them, um, shift to wanting to have a negotiated settlement of some kind, um, we're not gonna be moving towards that. And, and let's not uh, underestimate the effort it's gonna take to start the process to do this, right? This is not gonna be uh, a drive-by by Macron and a couple dozen people over a weekend and a high five and then a piece of paper that's signed. Like that, th this is gonna be a very complex deconfliction process. It is likely to take months. And so if, if we don't, and, and my view is nobody is starting that. Uh, the UN clearly is irrelevant in this process. Uh, maybe at a humanitarian level, they could become relevant. Um, and I don't think anybody's bringing that up ever either. Um, right. so, so I just think there's a lot of these pieces that you want to be aware of going forward. All right. Hey, folks, we're going to have to wrap it up in five minutes. Um, I, what I'd like to do before we sign off is have everyone kind of give their closing thoughts um, for the future or today's program. But before we do that, Richard, did you have anything else that you want to go over real quickly? Um, I mean, we have a lot. We have a lot of really great questions. Um, some of them. That's uh, why we're going to schedule part three. So that'll be coming up potentially in uh, April, but we don't have the date yet for that. Yeah. Um, no. So there's there's some points like is Ukraine allied with Turkey because you hear about Turkish drones. Um, they're not allies. They're they're more like friends who share a common enemy. Um, friends with benefits. Yeah, friends exactly. Benefits. That, that that that's 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 the right way to put it. Um, <laughs> Uh, one, uh, there's another question about the Azov Battalion and the integration of those who do have a neo-Nazi character uh, into modern Ukraine, similar to how Nazis are integrated into politics in the United States. I would say that that's really the right answer uh, in terms of how it's going to happen. These people are voters. They're part of that constituency. They're not taking over the Ukrainian government anytime soon, but they are certainly a part of the varied uh, militias that Ukraine has put together alongside its standing army. <clears throat> And, so uh, and, and one other quick point, Richard, on, on that. I think it's very important that uh, the Ukrainians at some point move from a localized militia construction of a military to a more professionally assigned non-territorial military. And then those types of forces get broken up. People go yeah. through traditional professional uh, development and you really start the sorting process like you would do in any modern military. No, I, I would say that for uh, for those of you who are familiar with Israeli history, this is exactly what happened when the when the IDF was created in 1948. You had a number of different militias. Some of them, like the Irgun and the Stern Gang, were known internationally as yeah. terrorist organizations. Terrorists, yeah. Yes, yeah. and you had some like the Haganah and the Palmach, which were much closer to an organized militia. But when the IDF came, they broke up the entire organization within the Stern Gang and within the uh, Irgun and reallocated those soldiers so you could create a modern army. And I, and that's exactly what Aaron is alluding to here. Um, I think uh, there's one last question that I want to address, which is that there's the Russian claim that there's genocides against Russian speakers within either the Donbass or in, uh, or in the area uh, of southeastern Ukraine. There's no evidence behind those allegations. There's like it's it's not even if there's smoke, there's fire. It's there's smoke because somebody farted. Like the, the, like this this has nothing to do with anything. Um, 
So if uh, if people are, are uh, ready to give sort of their final uh, closing, I think that I've spoken more than in th enough. In 30, in 30 seconds or less, give us all your final yeah, exactly. thoughts on this situation. Exactly. Like, like and we'll speech. come back. We'll, come, and we'll all so, come back for round three. Um, let's let's start with Greg. Yeah, no, I genuinely in agreement. Uh, I think it's uh, the latest thing you spoke about is a manufacturer thing. Uh, certainly, there's no genocide. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I I really don't know how it's going to end, uh, uh, unfortunately. That's all. I'm done. OK. All right, uh, Aaron. Yeah, um, thanks so much for everyone uh, for this. Um, I believe in the next 60 days, we're going to start to see the economic uh, repercussions, not just in Russia, but in Europe. And at some point, we're going to see if those things uh, change the behavior by Russians and Ukrainians to start a negotiated uh, settlement or not. And I think uh, we want to be helping all parties to sort of push towards that because we don't need more escalation at this point. Um, uh, Zach, do you want to say anything? Uh, or um, I guess I I'm going to stop sharing and so that way Daniel uh, can show us his shirt while he gives his final remarks. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, oh, so Daniel, do you, you want to say anything? Yes. So I've spoken to a military historian, and he draws parallel between this conflict and the conflict in Afghanistan, one land that has never been conquered, as in Ukrainian army, not army, army volunteers and Ukrainian soldiers are using, you know, basic tactics as, you know, foxholes, digging in and guerrilla warfare. And the saying that he had, if the Russian army has clocks, Ukrainians have the time. So long term, if this conflict goes on for another month, two months, a quarter or a year, Ukrainians will will because we will see the effect of sanctions in Russia, unless the China will step in and decides to help them. In my closing statement, think of Vladimir Putin is a bully. And the only way to deal with the bully is show your teeth. So after every, you know, after, after every attack, there should be a counterattack. And there is a prime opportunity since the, Russian, the Russians are retreating to Donetsk and Luhansk and Mariupol to enclose them. It's a prime opportunity for Ukrainians to um, kick their ass for good. So we need offensive weapons and not only the defensive ones. I know there has been a talk about supplying Ukrainians with um, F-16s, but it wouldn't really work because Ukrainians don't have the platform. If you're trained to fly, hey, hey Daniel, we, we have to we have to wrap things up. So um, let's hold that discussion. You more for round if three. you're if you're trained to uh, fly in MiGs, you cannot fly F-16s. So planes are you know could could not be the solution. Okay. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Zach, anything before we wrap up? Uh, no, I'm I'm pretty good. I think uh, yeah, we're good. Go ahead. Okay. Anybody else, Richard? No. Clear clear us out. Okay, awesome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. The YouTube recording of this, so we'll send out the email link for that, and hopefully we'll continue part three on a TBD date in April. Stay tuned for that. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend. You. Stay safe. Thank we'll you. Next all. Time. Bye. Thank all you. Right. Bye. 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 Thank you guys. I really appreciate you going deeper into more aspects of this. I really appreciate it. Okay. Um, and it's, I've been interested in everything you've had to say. So I really thank you. Blessings. Oh, thanks, Patty. <laughs>